You almost there? But I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> like I thought I just did this setting it up, but it's doing it again. Okay, I'm thinking we're live. Okay. Oh, yep. The unknown beer can collector just decided to come in. So I, I appreciate everybody taking the time uh, with the holidays coming up and everything. Uh, we wanted to take an opportunity to uh, to tap into one of the real uh, great uh, Paps Brewery uh, known co uh, collectors and historians, uh, Miss Kip Rodier. Uh, he is actually sitting in the 33 room uh, and I'll, I'll let, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Kip real quick before we start the brief. And Kip, tell us a little bit about yourself, how far away you live from the Paps Brewery and, and all those other things you like to share with us. All right, thanks Keith. Thanks everybody for joining tonight. Greetings from the congenial 33 room, which is the hospitality room at the former brewery, the Paps Brewing Company had here in Peoria Heights, Illinois. We will get into a lot more detail about that as the presentation goes on, a little bit about myself. I was born three and a half miles from the Paps Brewery. The wind must have been blowing out of the Northeast that day to get you know the beer in my blood, the collecting. I officially got started into collecting in about 1976, 1977. I was about 10 years old. My older brother and his best friend, Tim Kirshner, who's basically another brother to the family, they were into collecting cans. They were out digging and dumping for cans. And as a little kid looking up to them too, I, I got the beer can collecting bug in my blood and I haven't been able to get rid of it since. So as I got older and learned more about, you know, the breweries, you know, I found out that Pabst had a brewery here in Peoria Heights. I was aware of it growing up. If you ever had to drive through downtown Peoria Heights, you couldn't miss the smell. The semi trucks would block half the lanes of traffic. So it was a well-known presence. But as I got into cans, then I really got more intrigued about the brewery here and, and tried to learn, you know, why did Pabst open a brewery just 220 miles south of Milwaukee, their, their main headquarters that supplied beer internationally before prohibition. So tonight, hopefully we're gonna tell that story and, and you'll, you'll learn a lot more about Pabst and Peoria. All right, Kip, appreciate it. Uh, I'm gonna start with your slides there. And like I said, you just tell me when you want me to go into the next slide and that's, that's what we'll do. Okay, sounds good. If you wanna go ahead to the next slide. All right. So to start off, I mean, Pabst in Milwaukee, their first actual presence in Peoria was in 1881 when Best Brewing Company opened a branch here in town. Branches then were distributors. They were bottlers, depending on how close they were to the brewery. The farther the way you were from the brewery, the more, more expense you had shipping empty bottles back to the brewery to be filled. So it was just a lot easier for the brewery to ship kegs to the branches. They could bottle it on site and distribute it around town. And another big uh, feature of the, the branches were they were also you know, real estate agents. You know, breweries bought a lot of properties for tied houses and the distributors acted as the real estate agents for the brewery, you know, buying, buying up bars and leasing the bars so, so they could have their beer in that, in that tavern. There's no known Paps tied houses in Peoria. Obviously there was quite a few at one time. The only known tied house around here is up in Kiwani, Illinois. It's called Cerno's Bar and Grill, it starts with a C. If you're ever in the area, it's worth a visit. The bar was built in the late 1800s in Belgium by Pabst. It was handmade. It's a 50 foot mahogany mirrored bar with hand carved sculptures on it. If you're a Pabst collector, it's, it's worth a trip to, to Cerno's. Okay, next slide. So on this slide, you'll see an example of the, the bottle label that the Peoria branch bottled here in town for, for Milwaukee. And the letters you see in the background, those are from the late 1800s. Basically, every one of them was talking about real estate transactions like, hey, we, we're going to buy this or we're going to sell this. So it's amazing how much land and real estate breweries owned back before Prohibition and, and after Prohibition for, for tied houses. Yeah. 
Okay, you can go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, so this was a slide I added to Kip's brief. I had found it for him, and it came from a, a kind of a souvenir uh, postcard booklet, and it's dated May 1892. And like Kip was saying, I mean, the Peoria branch was not very far away from the original branch up in Milwaukee, the original brewery up in Milwaukee. But what I thought was kind of interesting was this actually shows all the different branch offices. Uh, there was a Chicago main branch, the Peoria branch, which is listed on there. Kansas City had a branch. St. Paul had a branch. Pittsburgh had a branch. Washington had a branch. New York had a branch. Galveston had a branch. Minneapolis, Harlem, Boston, Dallas, Denison, and Houston. So then it also says there were branches in Buffalo, New York, Louisville, Kentucky, and then up in uh, Wasau, Wisconsin, and Streeter, Illinois. So those are the types of branches like he was like Kip was talking about and Peoria happened to be one of those branches. And so on this slide, just to kind of give everybody some perspective how close it is. I mean, it's just down the road from Milwaukee. Granted, back in those days, there was no such thing as interstates. So still to push the beer down, it was still fairly close if they were going to push it down to Peoria because they didn't have the brewery functioning down in Peoria at the time, but they were doing all the bottling down there. So this kind of gives you some perspective of how close it was. All right, there you go, Kip. That's good. Okay, so to really start the story of how Pabst ended up in Peoria Heights in the Peoria area, we have to go about 85 miles southeast of Peoria Heights to a town, a little town called Decatur, Illinois. Decatur Brewing Company was down there, small brewery company doing good. They captured all the sales in the, in the local market. They were pretty much selling everything they were making. In 1912, local option for prohibition hit Decatur. When that hit, that wiped out the majority of Decatur Brewing Company's market, limiting them to down to 30,000 barrels is what they were brewing. It, it's interesting that even though they chose local option for prohibition, they could still brew for markets that weren't in prohibition yet. So to help offset some of this loss of their sales, Decatur Brewing Company actually went to Pabst and became a distributing agent of Pabst. Basically, they became a distributor for Pabst because Pabst was easier to sell in the farther markets where the smaller brewers back then incurred a lot of expense shipping their product. But selling Pabst was an easy sell and they could get more money for Pabst beer than they could theirs. So they went in with this venture with Paps distributing their beer. It was so profitable selling Paps that by 1916, Decatur Brewing Company quit brewing beer altogether and just was distributing Paps. But now you got World War I going on. You have sugar shortages because of the war. The USDA recommended malt syrup as a, as a substitute for cane sugar. So this, was very intriguing to Decatur Brewing Company. They wanted to get in the malt syrup market to help, you know, help increase sales. They got a brewery on their hands. Why not, you know, brewing beer and malt syrup is very close in step. So why not get in the malt syrup market? So they reached out to some chemical engineering consultants, the Singer Pearlstein Company in, in 1918 for help getting in the malt syrup market. So apparently the malt syrup that they started developing with the the Singer Pearlstein Company, you know, was a hit and started selling it. Sales started going through the roof. They maxed out malt syrup production at the brewery in Decatur. They bought a, a shuttered brewery in Steubenville, Ohio, and they started making malt syrup in that brewery. And, you know, sales kept going, kept going. Well, now they're out of capacity at that brewery too. So they decided we need to find a place that we can grow so they came up to Peoria Heights. They found an old automobile factory that they bought and they started construction of a malt, a malt house down on the river. So at the same time, this is 1924. Later in 1918, they actually started using the trade name Premier Malt Products, even though they were the Cater Brewing Company. So in 1924, they decided to make the move to Peoria Heights. They shut down the Steubenville, Ohio brewery because it was just too small. And at the same time, the offices officially moved to Peoria Heights. They merged the Decatur Brewing Company with 
the Singer Perlstein Company. And moving to Peoria Heights, they put Philip Singer, president, and Harris Perlstein as treasurer, which some of you perhaps people have probably heard Harris Perlstein's name, and it'll come up again later. Okay, go ahead to the... So Decatur was plant number one. Plant number two was the malt house down by the river. The picture on the left was from when it was Premier Paps, but the one neat thing about that photo is that if you can see it on your screen, the two huge Paps neons that they had. So every motorist going over the Cedar Street Bridge saw the Paps neons. The image on the right was a postcard that Peoria had put out touting the new Cedar Street Bridge. It was just a little luck that Paps Malt House was in the background. Unfortunately, all of these buildings are gone. The Cedar Street Bridge is still there. Just to the left of the, the black and white picture is where Hiram Walker is. So if you're familiar with Hiram Walker in Peoria. Okay, next photo, please, or next slide. So the automobile plant they bought in Peoria Heights used to manufacture the Glide automobiles from the Bartholomew Company. Uh, people local to Peoria, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt came to Peoria in 1910. They gave him a tour around town in Peoria and Peoria Heights in a Glide automobile. Up here on Grandview Drive, which is just right up the street from where I'm at here at the brewery. They took him on a, a drive on Grandview Drive and he dubbed this the world's most beautiful drive. So Peoria took that, making an acronym WMBD. And we have a, a TV station and a radio station that still use that WMBD. So, okay, so we'll get back to the brewery. Next slide, please. So after about a year of building improvements and additions, this was the brand new malt syrup plant in Peoria Heights, Illinois for Premier Malt Products. It was their headquarters, the main plant. If you can see in the middle of the image, there's the, the train. The loading docks were just on the other side of that from the original factory, but everything on this side of the train was, was added on by Premier Malt Products. The, the power station, uh, there was a recreation house, uh, Tennis courts, if you look down at the lower right of the image, tennis courts were added. Okay, so sales continued to grow for Premier Malt Products and their Blue Ribbon Malt Syrup. It was America's leading selling malt syrup, actually. So now they need to expand again for more malt syrup production. Next slide, please. So in 1927, they bought the old Lysey Brewery, which was actually an operation making malt syrup by the Bosch Food Products Company. So Premier Malt Products bought them out. That became plant number four, the syrup plant. And later on, they added a grist mill to it. So a lot of locals here, if you, if you hear somebody refer to the grist mill in Peoria, they're referring to the old Lysey plant. Okay, next slide, please. So this is later in 1927, uh, Premier Malt Products put out recipe books with countless recipes for their malt syrup because that's how it was pushed. It was advertised for baking, even though it was probably had more use as home brewing. But here's a shot showing all four plants, the caters in the upper left, the upper right is the malt house along the river, obviously the Peoria Heights main complex in the center. And if you look, Tennis courts are still there. And then in the lower right is the, the former Lysey plant. Okay, next slide, please. So some of what Premier Malt made here in Peoria Heights and Peoria Malt Syrup, some bakers did use it, home brewers used it a lot. Tobacco manufacturers, pharmaceutical syrups, maltose was made. Uh, the, the image of the boy putting a worm on a hook and the dog, Premier Malt had, had hired a, an author, an artist, commissioned him to do two paintings. This was 1932 and 1933. They actually issued those lithographs. And Lena is the, the lady's name, the mascot for Premier Malt. So Premier Malt products, you know, can't sell enough malt extract. They have the America's leading seller malt syrup. Now they're looking at national prohibition coming. So it's, or with national prohibition ending. Next slide, please. 
So now Premier with prohibition ending, you know, Pabst in Milwaukee is ready to start making beer again, but prohibition wasn't as kind to them. You know, they didn't make the money they did before prohibition. They'd actually leased some of the buildings in Milwaukee just for income to try to make ends meet and get through prohibition. Premier Malt, on the other hand, had more money than they knew what to do with, but they didn't have a nationally recognized beer to jump into the beer making market after the prohibition. So as luck would have it, Harris Pearlstein, who is now president of Premier Malt Products, him and Fred Pabst, who's the president of Pabst, they both were on the National Malt Products Manufacturers Association board and had worked with each other for years on the board. So they, they had an idea of how each other ran their business. Well, one of them threw out the idea like, hey, why don't we merge? I got the money, you got the beer. Let's, you know, it's a match made in heaven. So October 28th, 1932, they agreed to merge the companies and Premier Pabst Corporation was born. The next slide, please. So with prohibition in, and they need to make a brewery here in Peoria Heights. So in 1933, construction began actually on July 15th, ground was broken. Construction went out through the year. You know, the far right, the stock house and the rack house photos, tanks being put in. Next slide, please. Uh, so the grand opening of the brewery was in 1934. It was actually delayed because on January 29th of 34, a fire started on the fifth floor of the stock house. Uh, the fire actually melted the tank. The tanks you see there, the fire melted the linings out of all the tanks. Girders and beams were warped from the fire. The, the, the main tower was actually nine inches out of plumb due to the twisted metal. It's, I actually came across, there's a construction diary that somebody from the brewery had kept track of day by day building activities when it was, when it was built. So the, the entry on the day of the fire, I'll read what they, what they entered. The afternoon the fire started, there was a stiff wind blowing from the Northwest. It was eight degrees below zero. And the water supply for the fire pump was actually the cistern under the recreation building, which by the way, was empty as the floor was being repaired. The water pressure from the village of Peoria Heights was insufficient enough for this height. Downtown Peoria Heights had maybe four or five two-story buildings. So to have a six-story building, they, they couldn't get the water up there to get the fire out. So throughout the night and into the next morning, they finally got the, the fire out. So it obviously had to be rebuilt. The upper floors had to be rebuilt, which delayed the opening of the actual brewery itself. Next slide, please. So later in 1934, Premier Paps has their brand new Peoria Heights Brewery completed and ready to brew ale and beer for the corporation in Milwaukee. You can still see the original factory buildings on the right side and then everything in this new brewery construction, the loading docks and the bottle house is the building on the left. Just a little side note for another story later on, any, any rusty bunch of guys here who read the story about the Paps dump a couple years ago, there's a Paps dump that we found behind the brewery. If you look at the railroad tracks up on top, the one that kind of goes up in the upper right, you go up there about 50 yards and there's a, there's a ravine off to the right. They pulled the train car right there and all the cans got chucked right there. I've got one I can show later, but if anybody wants to go dig some Paps cans, there's still probably three or 4,000 of them there. Okay, next slide, please. So production begins in 1934. One of the main benefits of Paps having the brewery here in Peoria Heights was to help brew ale. Paps sold a bunch of ale before prohibition and, and having this extra capacity here for the ale brewing was, was huge for Paps. They obviously made blue ribbon beer as well. So those were the first two brands out of the brewery. The casino bottle that you see pictured here, that's courtesy of John Steiner from his collection. Uh, the Chicago, the, the, the World's Exposition in Chicago in 1933, 
Pabst actually built a casino up there in Milwaukee brewed casino beer for sale at their casino. Well, apparently the, the beer was well received from the public that in November of 34, they actually started brewing it down here in Peoria. And it's interesting if you can read the label, they use the, the Premier Puritan Company was the brand that they used because during Prohibition, I believe Pabst and bought up Puritan Company, which was making malt syrup. Uh, 1935, beer and cans were, was introduced for the very first time. And before, Paps actually test marketed their cans here in Peoria and in Rockford. But before they even test marketed their cans, Harris Perlstein, he is now president of Paps. He was the chemist that Decatur hired. He's now worked his way up to, to president of Paps. So when beer and cans was to be introduced, he's like, okay, we're not gonna release paps and cans until I can do a blind taste test and tell a beer from a bottle and a can. And when I can not tell the difference, then we're gonna put it on the market. The first time they put a can and a bottle blind test in front of him, he tastes it, that's the bottle, that's the can, get back to the drawing board. They did this two, three times before he was finally satisfied with the content in the cans. Like, okay, let's go to market. And in June of 35, Paps test marketed their Paps export beer. And they chose export instead of blue ribbon because they still weren't sure how this beer in cans was going to go over. And they didn't want to risk the reputation of the blue ribbon label. They had sold export beer before prohibition. So they decided just to put export on it. And that export was used up until 1938 when they finally you know, were confident to put the blue ribbon back on the cans. And it was eight, August 11th of 1935 that the first Kappa can was introduced. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is a, a article I cut out because uh, uh, we had talked about the casino beer. Yep. And I asked Kip if I could put this in here, but it just basically shows kind of uh, just historically where the casino beer name and, and brand label had come from. Uh, and this was the, the place set up to initially start selling the casino beer. So I thought to include that it's not Peoria specific, uh, but it does give you some historical background yeah. on where the, the name Casino Beer had come from. Exactly. It was just appeared to be a one-off beer they made for that, but it must have been a good one. Yeah, and this was another uh, ad I cut out. Uh, Kip had not seen it before, but I just wanted to point out that it says the largest, most scientific ale brewery in the United States. Uh, and it says to give America its own fine ale, we built our plant the largest ale brewery in the United States, embodying the most recent scientific developments of the brewing art, splendidly located in Peoria, Illinois, at one of the highest points in the state where the air uh, is pure and the water pumped from the deep cool wells is just right. So this was uh, some of the first ads that had come out uh, supporting Peoria and the, uh, the ale brewery. Yeah, those ads are neat. I'd never seen those before and that was from a New York a New York paper, I think, Keith? Uh, I can't remember where I pulled that one from. Uh, no, that was actually a Chicago newspaper from 1934. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's neat because they actually show an image of the brewery in the background. Okay, so this slide is some kind of random shots. The upper left, you'll see it's a picture from 1934 of the finished brewery. I wish I'd kind of put this one on its own slide. What, what I'm trying to show is is right in front of the brewery, that's downtown Peoria Heights. You see a couple buildings that are two stories tall. And then behind the brewery, it's all just a neighborhood. It just kind of shows you how the brewery just towered over this town. The, the original building obviously was three stories. It, it didn't look, but it, it's just amazing. The small little piece of land that they had that this massive brewery sprung from it and just towered over the, the city here. The picture in the lower left was a couple workers that up on top of the tallest tower, like the square step tower, they were up there tar in the top. The neat thing about this photo is the water tower in the background. When, when Premier Malt Products had it, they painted the water tower like a malt extract can. So in 1935, with the advent of the beer can, Paps painted it like their export can. 
you can't see in the picture, but they actually put cool before serving under the word beer. So, you know, my hat's off to the person that actually added that detail that you couldn't see from the ground because of the way that the bottom of the water tower was. For the person that took that picture, that was a cool little touch. The bottom picture was 1934 from the washroom. I believe Paps was the first brewery to use metal kegs. In the middle of the big machine is a keg washer. I, I cropped the picture out on the right of the picture. You just see a little bit. They actually had two hand debungers. So when the kegs would come in, they debung it, run it through the washer and send it off to be filled again. The picture on the right of the brew kettles, there's not many pictures. I've only seen three pictures maybe of interior shots of the brewery, which I think Paps didn't want to give out their secrets. This was one that Paps took. And if you're familiar with, there was a three postcard set that Paps put out. They actually colorized that picture of the brew kettles for that, for one of the postcards. Okay, next slide, please. So in December of 1938, the stockholders got together and decided let's change the name back to Paps Brewing Company. So they did. So the end of December, 1938, the name was changed to Paps Brewing Company. Business was huge. They were, Paps was doing great back where they picked up before where they left off before prohibition. And by 1941, the Peoria Heights Brewery had a capacity of a, a million barrels. And that's a cool little license plate topper in the lower right that I wish was mine. Next slide, please. So World War II, when, the, when World War II hit, obviously there was rationing tires, all kinds of things. I don't know how well you can read this letter, but uh, a, low, a, a former employee here, Scott Cranford, his grandfather also worked at the brewery. Pap sent him this letter to his house in January of 1942 to help discuss you know, the, the rationing. I'll try to read some of the highlights from it. Okay, the Paps Brewing Company will, effective at once, discontinue making deliveries direct to consumers. This, of course, includes delivery to your house. So if you worked here, you had beer delivered to your house. And it says that you still, in the future, pick up your beer purchases at the branch. However, we would like to call your attention to the neighborhood Paps dealer, where at a slightly higher price, you can make your purchases and at the same time do a great deal toward building up goodwill between your company and its customers. So it goes on to say about the, the, the already diminishing can stock, it has become necessary to discontinue the sale of canned beer at employees' prices. And it, it just goes on thanking them for their, their hardships. But this, so World War II, the, the, the neck label you see and then the top of the picture, it says no more ribbon, no more metal foil, Uncle Sam needs them. Paps had put those on the neck labels in September through December of 1942. And for the can guys out there, yes, Peoria Heights made an olive drab can and the, the silver withdrawn free can that you see for soldiers overseas. But before I go off from this slide, talking about you know the employees' beer sent to them at home, I, perhaps employees could buy, uh, I believe it was a case of beer a week was their allotment that they could buy. They had Quonset Hut set up just about a block from here, the, all the short pours, miscellaneous things they, they could buy over there. Uh, another thing is, could they drink on the job? Yes. From the, from the local brewery workers union handbook, section 15, free beer. Beer shall be furnished to the men employed free of charge during working hours. The amount and dispensing of it shall be subject to the regulation of the employer. It, so each break room had a keg tap. So when you went on your break room, you could sit there and you, you could pour yourself a beer. Uh, Talking with some of the former employees here, you know, some break rooms would have a hog trough in there where they might have canned beer in it if you wanted a canned beer. Obviously, having free beer on the job might cause problems, you ask. Talking with some of the former employees over the years, one of them, I don't know, it was 
which building it was in, but they had to use, you know, coal shovels, probably loading hops, some type of raw material. Well, apparently these two had been drinking the majority of their shift and they got into a fight with the coal shovels. So the guy that initiated the fight got walked out, but the other guy was able to keep his job. One of the other stories I heard was some of the employees when their shift ended would find their way down in the basement of one of the bigger buildings and just sleep there at night because it was free beer here at the brewery. So they just lived here at the brewery, found a place to pass out in and wake up and do it again the next day. So yes, there was probably a few alcoholics created because of that clause. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next slide, please. Post-war, from, from when prohibition ended in 1946, the brewing industry had numerous advancements, more power machinery, faster bottling lines, better refrigeration. So in the late 40s, you know, Pabst was always notorious on keeping everything modern, up-to-date, clean. So even though the brewery here wasn't that old, they went through and modernized the brewery. The, the building that I'm in with the 33 room was built there was, there was a laboratory. The laboratory is still here in the building to do all the testing of the water. And, and they advertised it as a soundproof air conditioned library, which that room is still here as well. So in 1949, when, this, when, the, when the renovation was complete, they had a week long celebration they called Blue Ribbon Week. Okay, good. Next slide, please. Every day during that week was a celebration, you know, all things past. If the program events uh, picture on the slide, you know, one day was dedication day, science day, community day, Illinois day, dealer distributor day, employees day. The picture in the upper left, the gentleman on the left is Eddie Canner, who was a radio personality PAP sponsored in the late 40s, early 50s. He came in, you know, he put on a couple shows at the Peoria Armory. That's what the, the blue ticket is. The Celebrate Blue Ribbon Week, everybody that showed up that week got one of those. The mugs in the lower left, those were handed out. Every day in the Peoria newspaper, there was ads congratulating Pabst on their new modern brew house. You know, Cohen Furniture, Supply the Furniture, they had an ad. It's hard to see, but the little, the one in the upper right that says congratulations on the top, that was from Gipps Brewing Company. They had put a quarter page ad in there congratulating Pabst on all the work. And and sadly, Gips would be gone five years later. But, but it was just neat how Blue Ribbon Week came about. And, and one thing I want to touch on in the picture in the upper left, if you've, if you've seen the Paps China, there was a set of China made for the Peoria Heights Brewery. As you can see, you might be able to see on the table, it's a, a sugar bowl. There's plates. Silverware was made with the Paps logo embossed in it. The chair Eddie's sitting in is actually an engraved Paps chair. Those were the original chairs and tables that were here in the 33 room. Okay, next. Oh, and then as part of the office building and the modernization of the brewery, a 500 seat auditorium was built in the brew house they called Blue Ribbon Hall. And a lot of the, the China was used in events they held out of Blue Ribbon Hall. And one neat thing about Blue Ribbon Hall is they'd hired an, an artist from Chicago to come down. He hand painted a mural on one of the walls of the auditorium on the history of brewing. Sadly, there are no good clear photographs of that mural and it was destroyed when that building was torn down. Okay, next slide, please. The 33 room, this is the room where I'm sitting. I'm sitting behind the bar about where that guy is standing in like the gray colored shirt. This was the hospitality room that if you came here and took a tour, you ended the tour, they brought you into the 33 room for beer and pretzels. Numerous thousands and thousands and thousands of people from around the world have been entertained here. The picture in the lower left was a celebration that the Peoria Heights community did in 1976. And the reason, if you're not familiar with Pabst, they came up with the 33 room was in the late 40s. 
one of the slogans Pabst was using at the time was blended 33 times to make one great beer or 33 to one. So the 33 room name was just a perfect name for it. Okay, next slide, please. So more than just Pabst beer and ale was made here in Peoria Heights, as I touched on earlier, casino beer was made in late 34. Old Tankard Ale was made in the late 30s. It was made again in the 50s here. Elks beer was brewed for a company in Kansas. I think it was just brewed here, shipped in kegs. They bottled it themselves. Uh, 1956, uh, Pabst took over the East Side Old Tap brand and it was brewed here in Peoria Heights. As you know, Big Cat Malt Liquor, Malt Lager, Stout Malt Liquor was all brewed here. Blatt's, Red, White and Blue, uh, I've, I've never seen an Ondecker can or bottle from here. I asked one of the employees, he wasn't sure if it was brewed here, but he's like, well, they had cans of Ondecker in the tubs of beer we could drink. <laughs> so it really didn't answer my question. Pabst Light was made here. There was a memo found by a fellow collector that that showed how much water to add to a batch of Paps to make Pabst Light. So. I don't know if made here, mixed here, blended here, but so Pabst Light was mixed here. Uh, next slide, please. So the China set, the cabinet on the left is believed to be the complete set of China that was made here minus a, tur a larger turkey platter, which obviously there wouldn't have been as many of those made. But there was a soup, soup bowl, creamer, pitcher, Sugar bowl, coffee cup, saucers, plates, baked potato bowl, salad plate. Those were all made for the for the Peoria Heights Brewery. And as you can see in the middle, you know, Pat, you know, they a nice little Peoria piece they put out. I think it was also tied in with advertising for boxing. The sign you see in the lower right was was made and hung in local bars around here primarily saying, hey, when Illinois stop and visit Illinois most largest and finest brewery here in Peoria Heights. Surprisingly, that sign is very hard to find. I had one years ago, the cardboard was so bowed, the ribbon was gone, I got rid of it knowing I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it. I didn't get another one until two years ago. It's just that sign does just not show up. There's it's probably about two feet by two and a half feet in size. Right out of high school, I was delivering ice in one of the bars I went into. I walked in and here's this sign, but it's a larger version, probably three foot by four foot. The only one I've ever seen. Nobody's ever seen the larger one. And of course that bar is gone. But across the top, you see the, the, the six glasses with different Peoria records on them. This started in 78 up through 81. It, it's pretty, pretty neat that, you know, the Peoria Brewery was still cranking out like there was no tomorrow. Like in 1978, if you can't read that, Peoria shipments, first half 1978, 1 1.6 million barrels. They had a three and a half million barrel capacity here at that time. So for them to be making just over 3.2 million barrels in the late 70s, you know, they were still cranking out the production here in Peoria. And the three, the three or four glasses on the right were through 81, you know, they were still setting records, racking, packaging, shift records. So, so the brewery was actually, you know, was doing pretty good, so people thought. Uh, next slide, please. So this was the, the headline of the paper, January 1st, 1982 in Peoria. A manager sees no hope for Pabst plant. <laughs> If we go back a couple of weeks, the week before Christmas, all the employees here at the Paps Brewery received a letter saying, thanks, we're closing down the brewery by the end of the year, Merry Christmas. You know, just, wow, thanks. So the union fought hard to keep it open as long as they could. They, they were able to keep it open until, until March of 82. And when these headlines come out, you know, I was 14 years old at the time. I'd, I'd been collecting for whatever, four or five years by now. I, I remember my mom, I must have said something to my, my mom about, you know, my frustration at the brewery closing. I'm 14. So she's like, well, if you want, 
I will take you there and we can take a tour of it. I said, no, you know, like, <laughs> could you imagine a 14 year old kid touring a brewery that's closed and saying, I collect Pat Peoria stuff. They would have probably gave me everything. I probably could have just, just for days loaded up car after car load of stuff, but someday I'll get over not touring here. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So March of 1982 was the last of the Peoria Heights Brewery. It was actually the fourth largest brewery in the US at the time with a three and a half million barrel capacity. Uh, Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, perhaps Milwaukee and probably Miller in Milwaukee would be the three larger than the plant that was here. 700 people lost their jobs. Uh, had a peak employment of over a thousand people here. Some people, I, I have talked to a couple of them, they will perhaps continue to make malt syrup down at the former Lysi plant. If there was jobs open there, there was a couple people that were able to get transferred there and fill them, but no, the majority of people lost their jobs. And, and Toby, you can probably agree with me on this. The rest of the 80s, there probably wasn't a single pap sold here in Peoria County, just for what it did to the community here. But one pick, one just before we move on from this slide, you can see that downtown at the bottom of the picture, you can see how the, the, the brewery dwarfed downtown. But in this picture in the upper, there's that large warehouse that was built in the 70s. Next slide, and I'll, I'll explain that a little better. Okay, so the city of Peoria Heights tried to find a tenant for the next couple of years, but the early 80s, the brewing industry was just in the toilet, basically. Nobody's looking to expand or to add new breweries. So no luck was found for somebody to come in and take over this brewery to continue to brew beer here. But the one thing I want to touch about on this photo is in the upper left, you know, I, I'd made the comment that large warehouse that was built for all you guys that are into, you know, minor variations, Continental Can Company had a, a plant in Peoria. It's plant number 460. It was in Pioneer Park up in North Peoria. They made the solder seam cans there. They shut it down in the mid 70s and they moved here to the Paps campus and they built that warehouse. So that was the Conowell plant. All the cans Continental made for PAPS was made there in the warehouse. And if you, if you look, there's a, an elevated conveyor that came into the back of the bottle house. So all the cans were sent across that conveyor into the bottle house, filled and out. Uh, talking with one of the employees that worked at Continental Can, he did not know if they continued to use that 460 designation once they moved here. I mean, I, I would understand if they did. I don't know why they wouldn't. So that's a little history on Continental Can, and obviously they had a good thing going here with PAPS to, to build their warehouse on the property. So after no luck of trying to find a new tenant for the place, they decided, well, let's try to repurpose the property, take out some of the brewing equipment and see if we can't make it into something else. Next slide, please. Well, in March of 86, they were taking the tanks out of the stockhouse and a welder's torch caught the tanks on fire. This is the same building that caught on fire in 1934 and the top three floors had to be rebuilt. So it's kind of ironic that the beginning and end of the brewery was due to, you know, started and ended with fires to the, the stockhouse. So in a year, this, with the brewery being right in downtown Peoria Heights, you know, the city didn't want a big giant eyesore here. So within a year, almost all the buildings were torn down. The building behind the boom of the fire truck, that's the office building that I'm in. The 33 room is actually on the first floor to the left side. So luckily the fire did not do anything to this building here. So in March of 86 was the fire. March of 87, the majority of the brewery buildings were torn down. In March of 88, the Heart of Illinois chapter, we had a, a beer can show here in the 33 room. It was open for rent. I was 20 years old at the time. I had a six month old daughter. I don't know how I come up with the money to rent the 33 room, but obviously the, you know, the Heart of Illinois chapter, we were always looking for new places for shows. So to have a show here was, was great. 
I don't know where I come up with the money at to rent it, but I had it figured out. I sold all the tables just to get my money back. I just wanted to break even. I didn't want to make a dollar. I just, you know, let's have another can show here. Every table was sold. And like I mentioned earlier, when, when we had the show here, all the original furniture from 1949 was still in the room, the chairs, the tables, you know, it, perfect place for a show. Toby was here. So, so I'm setting up at the table, greeting everybody, telling them where they're going to be probably back then in 88. I was probably collecting cash at the door. So as I'm sitting here, you know, at the second people in, well, they're checking in. The brew house was still left behind us. The, administ the administration building was mainly still empty because they hadn't rented out much of the office space. So people are coming in, setting up their stuff, and they're running through what's left of the brewery looking for stuff. So me, the Paps Peoria Heights guy, I'm sitting there checking people in. And Brent Burnett, you know, he comes in. Oh, wow, look what I found out here. Oh, my God, look at this. And, you know, Dave Dozier, little oh, guy, I found part of a chair. And, all this cool stuff and they're finding and I'm just waiting. Finally, when everybody's checked in, I'm like, oh good, I can finally go. Hopefully you guys missed something. So I went running through what was left and one thing left that they didn't, there was an old, I don't know how well you can see it, it says Pabst on the top and one AQ. But what this is, it's, it's an old film that, like an old movie would go in here, like a training film. <laughs> like in school, when they brought the card in with the big movie projector, the films were in a big metal box. So that, I mean, it's very neat and unique, but not what I could have found if I would have been the first one, but. Okay, so next slide, please. So that was March of 88 that we, that we had a show here for the Heart of Illinois chapter. Again, before the meeting started, if anybody was here for that show and you have pictures, please reach out to me. We're trying to see if we can't find some kind of footage from that show. So about a year or two later, the reason I didn't steal one of the Paps carved chairs that day was because I actually thought this would be an annual event, having a beer can show here. So I'm like, nope, I'm not going to steal anything. I want to be a good host. We'll come back. Well, within the next year, new ownership took over. They quit renting out the 33 rooms, so any future chance of a show was gone. Nobody, they couldn't find anybody to come into this space to lease it out. So finally, uh, a local jeweler, Brad Pettit, had interest of moving his jewelry store, so he actually come here and leased half of the 33 room. There's actually a wall put up here right now that, that cut it in half from where what it used to be. So about two or three years ago, I started working with the owners of the Paps campus here to have another beer can show here. We were gonna have it out back where the brewery used to be. Everything, all the details were set up. We had a date, flyers were made. I was just waiting on the last approval and then we could start advertising. Then I was told uh, the Paps building was sold, the campus, we got new owners, sorry, we sent all your information to the new owners, you know, good luck. I tried and tried to get hold of the new owners, no luck, no luck. I finally had a one ad in the local paper for PAP stuff. Well, they called me looking for stuff. So, so we, we got together and that's when they were like, hey, the jeweler is gonna be retiring in 2019. We're gonna bring this back to hospitality room and you know, get PAPS on draft here again. So when Brad, Brad retired in 2019, which helped pave the way to this 33 room to start selling beer again. One neat thing about Brad, the jeweler, his first job out of high school was making beer cans at the Continental Can Warehouse out back. So for him, it was kind of full circle to, to end up here. He actually had the first can that he made on display here at the back bar. So he retired, that's great, opened the way to, to, to bring in the 33 room back to life. The year before the building was sold, the other side of the 33 room was leased out by a daycare facility. So as soon as their lease is up, it's not gonna be renewed. This wall is gonna come down. It's gonna go back to its original size and, and back to, you can either rent it out if you wanna have an event. 
So it, it's great that Paps will be on tap here again. They're going to sell all the Paps seltzers, the hard coffees, you know, and how they're embracing the history here of the Paps campus. I was hoping it'd be completed by tonight, but there's going to be a large brewery and a case here, but that's okay. We'll have, we'll have updates in the future. Okay, next slide, please. So what's, what's up here today? The Continental Can Warehouse is the picture in the upper left. Sherman's, a local appliance center. They have a clearance warehouse in there. I mean, perfect use for the building. It's hard to see, but the little tiny picture that was from their grand opening ribbon cutting ceremony. If you look real close, you'll see me. I snuck in the back. I had to be here that day because I'd never been in the warehouse before. So, so that was a neat, a neat day. And my refrigerator at my house is was purchased there. So I do tell people I have a Paps fridge. <coughs> I do know the owner of Sherman's now. We went to grade school together. When he was getting interviewed for live TV on the grand opening day, you know, I asked him a question. I go, hey, have you, have you found any neat stuff left over from the brewery? He's like, well, when we were redoing the loading docks here for the trucks, we found a bunch of flat top cans. You know, before I could really get excited, it's like that building was built in the mid seventies. Those weren't flat top cans, but okay, well, but it's neat that they're using that space and, and very successful. The picture in the upper right is the office building that I'm in. The, the lower pictures is what the 33 room looks like today. The logo in the middle is a new logo that they have created for the rebirth of the 33 room. The lower right, uh, those were photographs I have from my collection from the first week. The picture on the far right was from Blue Ribbon Week. And various pictures of, of the 33 room that they put in a, a beautiful wall wrap here. But the new owners, uh, Robbie Matheson at the Grindstone Group, you know, I really appreciate him letting us do this here tonight from the 33 room. And like I said, Robbie and the the KDB group, the new ownership group, they really embrace the history of this place. I, once COVID hits, you know, we can have beer can shows, brewery and shows here, you know, every year. We can have them right here out back. We can have them right out here on the side. You know, they own a barbecue joint and a Kraft Brother, Poor Brothers Craft tap room across the street. They've given me more places where you could have shows when, you know, COVID lives. But the one, the one neat thing is he was able to have one official event at the 33 room before COVID hit. Next slide, please. The BCCA's own chapter, the Rice Brew Crew held a chapter meeting here this past January. The majority of these members drove at least an hour and a half up from Springfield to, to join us here for the meeting. And I mean, it was a great turnout. They heard this PAPS presentation. It was a little more edited than this. I've actually added a lot to it since then, but, but it was great that a BCCA chapter helped kick off the rebirth of the 33 room here in Peoria Heights. And since that picture has been taken, you know, the wall wraps weren't on the, the wall yet. They've done a lot of work in here since then. So it's, hopefully we can make this an annual event with the Rice Brew Crew meetings here and, and other BCCA events. And that's, all I have, oh, I have one more thing. I don't see any Rice Brew Crew guys here, so this might, this might be good. I have a trivia question to end the show. And the prize is a Rice craft beer can. What is the connection between Rice and Pabst? Well, Kip, we have everybody muted, so we're going to, we got a oh, couple. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we got a couple more things we'll talk okay. about, and then uh, and then we'll open it up. We'll 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 let people unmute. But yeah, there was a couple more things we wanted to go through, uh, specifically just to talk about the cans a little bit. This was stuff I added. It, it, it was focused on the Peoria folks uh, and the Peoria brewery primarily, but what I thought yeah. was kind of interesting because this is when the they were still primarily the ale was only brewed and canned here at Peoria. Right, and it, it, the ad that's shown on the right, that beer can was only made in Peoria. Yeah, so that came out- A bit and of advertising with, with that can. Yeah, and everybody would have thought that uh, ale was not a popular brand uh, outside uh, other than maybe the Northeast, but granted this ad was from the Boston Globe. 
Um, I can't read the year, I think it's 1935. I also saw a lot of ads surprisingly out of Florida. Same ad, uh, Tampa, Florida had an ad and Miami, Florida had an ad as well. So then obviously the next one was where they took by paps off the bottom of the can and then they went with the red opener and uh, Kip and I talked about, there's no specific reason or known reason, but maybe someone else knows why they chose to use the red paps uh, opener for the Peoria cans, so. Exactly, like Keith said, nobody really knows why red was used on that. And then there's a couple other cans post OI cans that, that use red for Peoria. There's a couple other things we'll talk about in a slider here too. Go ahead, Keith. Okay. So so then the, the, the dump that uh, Kip was talking about, this was the article from the Rustlings uh, that actually talked about it. So I, I wanted Kip to, to kind of talk a little yeah. bit about exactly what, what transpired at the at the dump. So years ago, Nick Johnson and myself, when Nick still lived here in Illinois, we were, for whatever reason, it's like, well, let's go behind the brewery and see if we can't, you know, there's that patch of woods back there. Let's go back there and see if we can't, you know, find something they discarded. So we're back there and, and we start finding lids of cans. Well, okay, well, this is a good sign. So we start digging and as you can tell, those cans were very close to the surface. It was like some kind of almost volcanic rock slag crap on top. So it didn't take much. You didn't need any tools to really dig into them. And then we realized it's all the same can and bottle. We, we estimate there's probably six to 8,000 cans and bottles in this pile, three to four feet deep at the thickest part and maybe 15 feet wide going down a, a ravine. Every can, they were, they were filled and packaged. Every can was in 12 pack boxes. And for some reason they, they had instructed whoever dumped these cans, they had to poke a hole in every can. So this, isn't, this is one of the cans I found, you can't see it here, but there's a hexagon hole, one hole so they had to sit here and punch something in every can and then they just threw the boxes. Well, the bottles got thrown first. All the full bottles got thrown first. So whatever didn't break when they threw them, the cans on top would more than likely break them. Every can, as you can see in that picture, the tape residue from the boxes was still on some of the cans. And you can see in some of the pictures, I mean, there were still 12 cans next to each other like they were still in the box. There was just that many of them pitched. And I have heard from another employee, because I asked him about this, if they did that often. He's like, well, I have heard stories that, you know, they dumped beers back there and people would go back and get them. So that's why they tried to open them, pop them, something. And everyone had an Oklahoma tax stamp of these cans. I still found full bottles that, was it, that didn't break, that still had a head on them. But Keith, I'm not sure, like when I was out there taking the pictures for this, for the Rustlings article, one of the pictures I showed, I'd found a piece of an old Pabst. I found an old light up 40s Pabst sign back there. It's like, don't know if it came from the brewery because there was some household dump stuff back there. But after I got back from Alaska, uh, dumping with Daniel, I went back there with my gold bug to see if I couldn't find any more pockets like this, figured, okay, maybe metal detector and get down deeper. Maybe we can find some other dumps back there. Didn't find any more dumps, but I found another piece to that damn light up sign. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I got half of it now, but unfortunately there's no, no Bach cans in that pile, no half court cans in that pile. But yeah, if anybody wants to go back there, there's still thousands of them back there in, in that condition. <laughs> unfortunately not worth anything. And I, I think that's the last slide. Yeah, that's the last slide we've got there, Kip. So what I wanted- I've got, a few, I've got a few cans and little miscellaneous stuff here. If you want me to try to walk through and show some of them the best I can. Yeah, so go, go ahead and if you want to talk a little bit more about cans and we'll open the, the mics up for everybody so that they can ask- Yeah, go ahead. Well, it didn't take me a minute. I'm just worried about Jeffrey Tobin there. Uh, I want to make sure he doesn't uh, 
uh, ruin the uh, the presentation, but no, go ahead. I'm, <laughs> okay, I want to win the can. Okay. 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 I, I, I cheated, but does anybody else know the answer? Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, um, we Rice could both left. cheat. Well, the Ed Rice, Ed Rice left Rice Brewery to go to Peoria to brew, right. and that killed Milwaukee. Rice Brewing, basically. Exactly. Yeah, he, he left to go to Milwaukee to be the brewman. And I didn't realize he left in 63 and the brewery stayed open until 66. Right. Yeah, I thought I thought the brewery closed and that's when he came to pass. But no, it was you're right. So yeah. So I got a hey, next comment. time I see you, I'll, I'll I'll try to have a full six pack with me. <laughs> that's fine. I might come dig some paps behind the old brewery with you one day. Come on down. Come on down. So I got a question. Um, so this is the Peoria Brewery, but have you visited like the historical Paps Brewery and all the buildings there? I I've been to Milwaukee once. Like they have the best the best place there now, which he has the hospitality room. I've been to that one, and at the time he toured you through one of the buildings. But I don't think he owned the Bottle House or any of the other. The, the right, right. House well, anyways, I just. Obviously, each brewery had their own 33 room, and I know there's that kind of stuff at the historical one, too. It's just kind of neat to see the other breweries version of that. It is. And the one in Milwaukee, it's really neat because if you're sitting at the bar right above it, there's a hand-painted mural of the Milwaukee brewery, and they also have one of Peoria up there. Right. When you talk about the, the, the artist who came down there, I wonder if it was the same artist that did the work at that brewery because a lot of that still exists in that brewery i'll have to look and see I've, I've got the name of the guy that that come down here and did this i'll have to look and see if i can find who did the milwaukee one and if you ever need to get a hold of the lady who is in charge of that historical museum up there her name is cheryl comp and she's a okay. bcca member and i'm you know if you call her she'll take you all over that place okay so before we before we get much further, I, I, I want to start off first by thanking Kip. Obviously, if you sat through the whole presentation, I don't think there would have been anybody else other than Kip that would have had the amount of information specifically about that brewery. And I thought it was a great opportunity for him to kind of pass along his knowledge uh, with the webinar that the BCCAs are hosting. Uh, I, like I said, I don't think you're going to find somebody more knowledgeable on the, the, the brewery there specifically in Peoria. So right now you can unmute your mics. If you got a question, uh, just try to be, uh, you know, uh, courtesy, show some courtesy. If somebody's already asking a question, just kind of try to back off a little bit. So not everybody's stepping all over each other, but the floor is open for any discussions, anything that you want to ask Kip about, anything you want to ask me about the BCCA or otherwise, Please, this is an opportunity for us that enjoy this hobby to all kind of talk about uh, things that uh, we normally don't get to talk about because of the whole COVID piece. So the floor is open. Well, good job. That was a good one. That was a good one. Thank you. Well, I'm going to try. I mean, the lighting's not real good in here before we go. I'm going to try to at least give you a, a little better tour of just the back bar here. So. Any questions? Did you um, read the last piece in the rustlings about the World War II Peps can? Kip, who's hiding? Yes, I'm, I'm, I can hear you. I, I know Chris is looking into that, whether that was a can that came from Peoria or if it came from Milwaukee. I don't know if they made olive drab in Milwaukee or not. I think they did. Peoria and Milwaukee made them. Okay. And let me try to get my computer in better light. Some of the, if you're familiar with Paps cans, let me see. Okay. Try to get this so I got better light. Okay, and here if you're familiar with it, if I can find my camera. Let's 
See, the, the PD, if you're familiar with PAPS cans, that's, you know, the P's for Peoria, the Milwaukee kids, had MD. People always wondered what the D stood for. You know, it's always been, you know, department, division was the most logical reason of what the D could stand for. But recently somebody had posted a picture of the, the there's a withdrawn free version of this can that was only out of Milwaukee. Peoria never did one, or if they did it, nobody's found one yet. But if you look at the back on the withdrawn free PAPS cans from Milwaukee, it says M-E. The E is for export, for domestic. So if you wondered what the, the D stood for, it's domestic. And then as far as, I didn't know, PAPS cans, if, if you clicked, Tops. If you're not familiar with the coding, at the bottom where all the, the cities are listed, after the word tap a can, there's a little letter number combination. A1 means it came from Milwaukee, B2, Peoria, C3, Newark, D4, LA, and then E5, Paps, Georgia. And that's the order that each brewery came into the Paps organization. They just gave them a new. So if you ever see a B2, that's Peoria. Yeah, I tried to click on unmute uh, and tell everybody they can unmute themselves. I, Toby's uh, unmuted. Go ahead, Toby. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a couple of things to add and, and Kit, wonderful job, a beautiful job. Toby. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was under the impression that, that daycare you mentioned in um, after they closed, was a part of a that they were teaching nurses at the at the uh, brewery there, and okay. the daycare was for the pe the nurses that had kids to go with the. Oh, okay. Pool. So th that was just a little addition that I'd heard that I'm not positive of that information, but I heard it. Um, okay. Also, um, my my, my uh, experience was I went to um, the brewery about 1987, <laughs> 98, 89, somewhere in there because I moved out of Peoria in 91. But okay. um, um, I went to the, to the brewery and it was totally, all the security was gone. There was one person in the booth and that was it. And I just said, well, I'd like to go in and walk around. And they said, sure, go ahead. <laughs> so I went into the uh, administration building and I have uh, uh, one little piece that I, I mean, there wasn't much to find, but I have a, um, a piece of the, um, the, the word, the E in Premier Pabst that they, oh, okay. they put together and it, it's the, uh, it, uh, the addition that, that was made with all the measurements on it and everything else for the great big sign. You know what I mean? It wasn't right. just an E, it was, a, it's quite a little thing there. And, right. And I, that, that was, but there wasn't much to take. I mean, a couple bottle caps on the floor. I mean, you know, and then right. they were just burnt. There was nothing. Um, right. Yeah. Well, one thing that they want to do, Toby, is they want to recreate those metal letters and, and put Paps Brewing Company back on the front of the building. I'd like to see that. Yeah, they actually amazing. reached out to me and said, hey, is there any way you can try to find out the size of those letters? And it is, it, it, it's crazy as, as luck would have it, you know, Jim Searle had, he had this three ring binder of miscellaneous paperwork from a former employee from the late twenties and thirties. Hmm. He had a blueprint from when they built the original buildings the brewery buildings in the 30s that showed exactly what brick they ordered, what color, what the size was, what the mortar gaps were supposed to be, and dimensions for every five rows. So I pulled that up. I had a picture of the letters. I'm like, okay, well, that's, you know, five rows tall. So I did the math. I'm like, okay, well, they're going to be this tall by this wide. It just blew them away that I gave them that <laughs> information. But I had the blueprints of, of how they made the building. So it was well, that's Did kind of what of this letter E is. It's a, like a blueprint. Yeah, yeah. Did any of those letters show up? No. I mean, the only one I've heard of is, is Toby's E. We don't know where any of those went to. And that I just found in a drawer on a desk up in the administration building. Yeah, hmm. I mean, it was there was a bunch of them, things there, but I just took the one. Okay. Most of them were destroyed, you know. And I don't know if I touched up when I when I talked about the China. They also had silverware made with the PAPS logo stamped in it. Yeah, 
when the yeah, when the they, brewery closed down, apparently what they did is they told the employees, you know, help yourself if you want to grab some china, grab it. If you whatever, we don't care. They actually they actually paid somebody. They had I was to figure this. So this is eighty two. Pabst had ten million dollars they put to decommission the brewery. So it was just sick that the money that they had to spend to shut it down. But so they're trying to, you know, recreate that, get that going again. So let's see if I don't know how well if I can try to give people a better tour. So the pictures on the wall. So that somebody was standing behind the bar and they took that picture. That was the opening week in March of 49. Let's see. This, it's hard to see, but that's the original bartender. But you guys will just have to come here to the 33 room and see it. Is there any word on a grand opening yet? We're just waiting for COVID to lift. Okay. I'll be there. Good. You yeah, got my chair, brother. You got my chair. <laughs> I do. I do. And it came from Blue Ribbon Hall. Right. <laughs> but yeah, due to the light again, when, when we have an official announcement of when this is going to be open to the public, I'm, I'm definitely going to shout it because they, you know, they, they love the fact that, you know, we appreciate the history of this, this piece of land here. So, Kip, when that happens, uh, I, I think it would be appropriate for the BCCA to put out an e-blast to let all the members know that uh, a, a piece of the PAPS history is open back up again. And I, I think uh, if you would just coordinate with me and with uh, um, Charlie Smith on uh, trying to get an e-blast out, we'll make sure it's up on Facebook as well, too. But we, sure. we think we should take an opportunity to, to blast it out once we know that it's uh, officially back up and running again. Definitely. I'm curious. I'm yeah, curious about right. if any. Ooh, look at that. Last day period cans. Employee <laughs> beer, not to be resold. Dime a dozen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Around here, these used to be. They're everywhere. Yeah. They don't turn up as much anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, so, have you heard any stories when the buildings were torn down about cans coming out of the walls? Because, I mean, through the time that, you know, their buildings were built, yeah, especially the 30s and 40s. And, I, and I've thought the same thing about the administration building that I'm in. It was built in 49. I've, I've luckily, I've been able to go through every room in the building, the basements, crawl spaces with flash. I didn't even find a, any tab tops. It, it's amazing, the total void of anything. They had their own construction crew, so they had their own people building it. So <laughs> I figured you'd be do down there like a, like a loading dock. I know there was an addition on there. and. And in the back part, there were some additions put on. Yeah, the, the, the back in the medical medical building, those were all wooden walls, but brick outside. Yeah, when they added onto the loading dock, that would have been forty nine, early fifty. Oh, okay. There's a good chance that could have. I was when I talked about, I'd come across somebody had kept a construction diary. You know, like today, the, the storage tank showed up, you know, blah, blah, blah. When the bricklayers got here and started building a stock house, on the first layer of bricks, they put a bunch of coins in it. There's two or three different memo entries in that diary that, hey, the, the north wall of stock house, we put coins in there when we built it, but obviously it's all gone now. I mean, it would have been nice to know before they tore it down, like, hey, we need to look at this corner. <laughs> When they tore down the um, Gibbs building, which is just a couple miles from there, there were the, we did find some uh, in the walls there. Oh yeah, we. we yeah. The, the old canning line at the Gibbs Brewery, they would drink beer, and there was a ledge. They would chuck them up there, and they. Right. And yeah, we found, but they were all trash. The funny thing about yeah, they were they were trash. There was nothing that was worth saving, but it, the but they were there. <laughs> right. The funny thing about this, when Kip and I were speaking, we were actually in the building at the same during the same time when we were 18 years old <laughs> and 16 years old. I think you were 18. You said now 16 or something like that. Yeah, I was 14 when 14? they came. Okay, well, I must have been 12 or something. Then. 
And then, okay, another, another side story. Okay, Red, White, and Blue was made here in Peoria Heights. Originally, it might have been a quality beer. I think, you know, as time went on, it became one of their, you know, cheaper beers. So I'm 15 or 16 at home. Uh, what's in the fridge? Open the fridge. Dad had a couple red, white, and blues in there. Ah, oh, sweet. <laughs> Snag two of them, run up to my room. Pop one open, take a drink. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. <laughs> I'm just not into the taste of beer yet. No, this shit is terrible. I ended up taking the second can and putting it back in the fridge. <laughs> But looking back on it as an adult, the brewery closed in March of 82. This could have been two years later at this beer. So my dad probably bought it on clearance at a store that, so it was probably a three-year-old red, white, and blue from the Heights. <laughs> so. Hey, I got a question. I don't, I'm Clayton, but I know most of the people here, but I don't know who M is. And obviously he's somebody who is close to you. So who are you, M? He's babysitting my chair. Okay. Yeah. No, Kip, I'm from the Heights as well. I grew up in the Heights. Yeah. And the um, I have to find Kip on Facebook. We started chatting a while back, and we're basically. Yeah. Basically, and, um, we have right. a hell of a lot in common. Yeah. And, yeah, well, and Terry's nice. talking about somebody just recently on eBay had put up two chairs advertised as being original to the 33 room. They weren't from the 33 room, but they were from Blue Ribbon Hall. I've got pictures of those actual chairs in Blue Ribbon Hall. So they were legitimate, but luckily Michael turned me on and it was local pickup only. And since he lives up it worked out great, I could just go pick his up. And when we finally have a, a grand opening here at the 33 room, he's going to I will be there. Yeah, he will be here for that. And he can get his chair and all that good stuff. So now, where, where, where is the 33 room at? It is in Peoria Heights, downtown Peoria Heights, the, the old office building of the, the former Paps Brewery here. Oh, I, I okay, okay. I've I've been by it. I've taken pictures. I just didn't. Is the how long is the, is? I didn't know it was still there. Yep. I mean, we are very lucky that this building yeah. torn down when they tore down everything else because the fire was in the stockhouse. Uh huh. Down so many buildings that had nothing to do with the fire. They just wanted it gone at that point, which was sad because they could have just tore the stock house down, but whatever. So the, the building that's 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 still there, because I'm I'm sorry it came in a little bit late. Um the building, the 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 bigger brick structure that's still there, what was that? Office building or the one that looks like a warehouse? It's got a bunch of windows in it, so I'm assuming. Okay, it's yeah. Office. So that's the office building right on Prospect. That's the 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 main administration building. That's the building I'm in right now. Okay. If you were standing on the street looking at that building, yeah. Yeah, that's the building in the upper right. Yeah. Yeah. What you can you see the red canopy that's going into the main, the front door to the building back. Okay. Originally, to get to the 33 room, you would have went in the front door and you would have came to the left. Oh. When they subdivided the 33 room, they added a door to the outside. So you, to the left of the main canopy, you see like a smaller little red canopy sticking above my picture. Uh -huh. That comes to the 33 room. Okay. Yeah, if you now can see that little bitty canopy. Yeah, they added a door. It's the first floor to the far left if you're looking at the building. On this uh, Sherman's here, um, what what is that? It's an appliance uh, company here in Peoria. They've been here since the 70s. It's a, f a small family-owned business that really does a hell of a job when it comes to appliances. They opened up a clearance center here for their, any scratch and dent or maybe stuff that's just been laying down. But they've got a huge warehouse full of appliances here at, at pretty good prices, actually. No, uh, um a he friend of mine's from friend of mine's from peoria i think he bought something there i heard a story from him talking about that once yeah brian okay. and we recorded this we did it on facebook live so you can even look at it on the bcca facebook page and then we're also going to post it up on youtube and onto the bcca page so you can always go back if you miss oh, okay. something it'll be an opportunity oh. for you to see the whole thing again as well uh -huh. hey i got a couple questions for you 
Sure. Um, I have a 10 ounce Pabst uh, soda can. I think it says Peoria Heights, Illinois on it. It could. Those were made in Milwaukee. Well, in Milwaukee? Yeah. Pabst, I mean, they were real good about listing all their breweries. And, and, and like we talked about earlier with the red opener for Peoria and the, and the dark opener for Milwaukee, nobody knows why. Yeah, this is a soda can. It's air sealed. I, mean, I don't know okay. really what, what they go for at all. There's about 24 different ones. Um, if you have it mint, it, it goes for big bucks. Most, yeah, of the ones you, one, most of the ones you see are grade three, maybe. No, this, this, one's, this one's the uh, black cherry. <laughs> Yeah, but it, I mean, it, 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 what's the condition? That's what matters, what it costs. The, the, the very, very few of them are, are mint, very few. It, it's it's close to mint. It's really nice. Then it's worth worth some bucks, yeah. It's, I know it's a 10 ounce. Yeah, they all are, yeah. When did those come out, the 40s? Uh, no, it was, was it, it's gotta be later, later in the 40s. I, I would say in the 50s. Yeah, the, it, says, uh, it says brewing company on it. That's why I thought it was odd. The the the, the, the soda book says uh, 1955 was when the sodas primarily had come out. Yeah, it's like it's my it's like that and then that and my Miller are my two first flat tops because my dad gave me a bunch of soda cans and those two were in there. <laughs> That's a good find. Good yeah, my dad bought it. Oh God, long time ago. Because my dad used to start, my dad collected soda cans. He had like, I think, 20 of them. And he said, Here, you start collecting. So he gave me those, and there was another <laughs> can. In there. So that's, that was my first beer can, I guess. But and then I found a, a display rack for uh, Paps cans that I know nothing about. I don't know if I can show you a picture of it, I don't know if I can screen share or something. Me. Yeah, you, you'd have to give them the screen share capability there, Dan. I, I can do that now. I'm doing that right now, actually. Here it is. Uh, can you see it? It's it's sideways, but yeah. Yeah, my, my, phone's, my phone's broken. <laughs> but it, it says, take home the handy six-pack with the convenient handle, uh, lift-off rack, easy to carry. Shows a price, obviously, but... No idea what the age on that is. What material from, is it? It's from metal. The 50s. Metal? I've never yeah. seen it before. Yeah, that's from the 1950s. Yeah, I've not, I've not seen that. Because they started using that finest beer served anywhere slogan in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I found that, oh God, I think at a flea market. I was looking for cans at the time, saw that instead. I'm like, well, that deals with cans. So I'll just buy that. <laughs> But I, no one right. knows any. I don't think anyone knows anything about it because I, every one time I ask someone, they like they've never seen it. Never seen it. It's for a twelve pack rack. That went in a liquor store, either six. No, or the yeah. handy six pack. Um, yeah, they, yeah. it's like they slide onto those like prongs. And it's like yeah, stacked they, they of built it full of six packs, and you walked up and grabbed what you wanted. And probably nineteen fifty to fifty one. Older than what I thought. That's good. There's a rack similar to that that uh, was put out during Prohibition that held their little round things of cheese. Hmm. It, it's a similar rack like that, and, and that might have right. even been a, where it's changed over to hold them. Toby, you're yeah, from Peoria, for... right? What? You're from Peoria, correct? I spent 25 years of my life there, yeah. What I'm not there. Me? I'm not there now. I'm in Tennessee, and What'd I'm just me? Hicks. Okay. There was a Toby yeah. who was a beer can collector in Peoria. That's yeah, me. Toby Harms. That's you probably knew her as Toby I was Harms. Toby Harms, and now I'm Toby Hicks. We met each other way back in the day. Okay. We went over your house and saw your collection. What's your name? Michael Foster. I don't know the name. I mean, uh, no, you wouldn't. No, I mean, you wouldn't. I, but I saw I, your My collection. brain is old now. Yeah. No, no, it's not. I'm no, not I sold funny. my collection in um uh in the 90s and, oh. and the and the 20 and the 2000s yep. because i moved to arizona and i didn't have room yeah i bet so i so you i mean, took good a on it didn't you oh yeah you i, I paid off my house stuff. and paid off my car oh yeah, yeah that's i did I real good on it that's i saved good. a whole bunch of pieces I've, I've got all 24 of the wooden signs left and yeah. i've got um uh, 
Well, I have a whole room of paths, but most of them are just cheap signs. Mm -hmm. I only have, I have one prohibition piece and um, one other, and then I have another one I, I destroyed on the move. And Were you in Tennessee? Uh, just south of Nashville. Okay, I'm in Charlotte. Charlotte. North Carolina. North Carolina, okay. We're well, nearby. Yep. What? We're nearby. Yeah, well, relatively speaking. <laughs> so is Peoria, yeah, I is. guess. I haven't, haven't been back to Peoria but once the whole time I've been gone. Are you going to uh, go back for the 33 opening? Yeah, I, I yeah, sure yeah. will. I'll see you there. You'll have to, Toby. Oh, yeah. I'll have to. Yeah, yeah. Please Definitely. Now, hey, I, want um, to say, oh, I want to say one thing about the dishes. They were also made for the trains. They used them on the trains when they had, you know, they, when you eat your meal on a fancy train. That's, that's another reason where you found a lot of the uh, dishes from different breweries. And, and Paps was one of them that was also found on the trains. Is there a way to tell the difference on the bottom? No. No? They're all That's the same. They were the same manufacturer. Everything's okay. the same. Yeah. Some of them, some of mine say Peoria. Some of them don't say Peoria. I was curious. Right. Yeah, Michael, no. I did, the only thing I can come up with that is when they initially ordered the, the yeah. Yeah, was one and over breakage, they had a, a second order down the road. Sure, sure. Every reason it wasn't Mark Peoria. Oh, Peoria was the only one who had the dishes, or did Milwaukee have them too? As far as I know, those were only Peoria. Okay. I've never heard of any stories or pictures from Milwaukee using that china. It was just for here. Did you guys see the ones on eBay right now? It came up yesterday for two hundred apiece. Huh. No. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I need the turkey platter. <laughs> yeah. What, dude? Yeah, Toby Michael's got two of those porcelain building number signs as well yeah, yeah I, i've got one of those and then the other one that says uh it's a it's about a foot long and two inches deep that says uh to the brew house i got okay. that one to, to go with it yeah hey mike let you know there's a new chapter in uh tennessee, tennessee called the Smoky mountain chapter <laughs> yeah i i heard about it they get, they just not, just started this this last BCCA meeting. Jim Toby. What? Yeah, there's Michael's signs. Hey Don, you got some radio or something feeding, back feeding there. Don. There. Sorry, I had to mute you, Don. You you had some some back feedback or something for some reason. I don't know why. Like he's at a brewery, but, but yeah, Toby. I I ran into somebody that uh, that lived locally. That after the brewery, after the fire, and you know, sitting here empty. Well, they had they had guards protecting the 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 grounds. He lived locally. He's like, yeah, we just ride our bikes over here, and we'd ride right by the guards, and they would just right, right. we just see the buildings. <laughs> and we saw something cool. We took it. My like, God, oh, uh -huh. didn't I do that? <laughs> yeah, that's what Becker, we did. <laughs> right after when it happened, when Becker had it, the um. I went up to the guard at the gate and I said, can I, can you show me around? He goes, well, okay, come in. He goes, I need the company when I do my rounds. Like, okay. So I went walking around with him on his rounds and, um, <laughs> and we were in the old part, you know, the Bartholomew building and in the back and wow. we were planning on going to the office. Sold. He goes, I can't bring you anymore. You can't come back anymore. And that's when they, Becker sold it. Becker didn't care, but the new people, he said, no, we can't do this anymore. Okay. And they, they actually had a fire in the office. He said, or no, somebody poured a lot of gas. And arson tried to start a fire and okay. he stopped them. Yeah. So if wow. they would have started that fire, that would have been burned the whole thing down. Guaranteed. Exactly. There'd be nothing worth anything left. They poured gas up and down the stairwell, he said. Wow. He just caught it. You know, he didn't know who did it, but I've always been curious. And I mentioned this before on, um, on the um, Steiner. I asked him the, um, at the top of the tower. And I asked him on Facebook and I think he responded to that, you know, but what else was up there? Was there like an observation post or something or what? They had a flagpole up there. Because you can see that the slits, you know, that you, looks like you can look out of. And the kids got up there and spray painted. And I know who did. Exactly. I, I think at the mm -hmm. peak of it, I think they had like a glass dome, almost like a beacon from a lighthouse. I oh. I th think is what they had at top of some type of beacon. But I know there was a flagpole up there. Yeah, I know they had the antennas and everything. I was just curious what was inside of it. But yeah, for those of you that that not aware, you know, after the the brewery shut down, 
somebody got up on top of the, the tower that he's talking about, and it's kind of like a stepped tier top. <laughs> well, the Van Halen symbol logo was spray painted on there and, and for <laughs> And even in some of the demolition pictures, there's this big, you know, the VH. And, yeah, the picture you had. But they had, then, to, they had to go down with a rope or something because it didn't look like it was easy to get down there. Yeah, ex 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 I don't know. The only thing I could think, the stairwell in, in the roof hatch was still there when they did it. And then another kind of local, I get whatever, not legend or whatever, where all the train line, the the rail lines came in back here behind the, the old bottle house, somebody sprained it spray painted who is John Galt and, and that was just something that just local legends you know nobody knew what the hell but I think it, it, but it's weird the random spray painting that, that occurred here yeah I guess the fences were wide open back then exactly and and it, yeah but I've got a few other items here I'll try to see if I can't show this was a test can in the late 70s, early 80s, Augie Pabst was the, the person in charge here at the Peoria Brewery. In this can, it's hard to see. It's a plastic can, Pabst. It was filled with beer. If you see, there was a hole poked in the bottom and the beer was drained out. There's actually still staining from the beer. But Pabst was experimenting with the, the, the plastic cans, which I think, you know, some of the other, the beer can guys, you know, there's a couple foreign companies that were experimenting with them, but no brewery information, just a generic. It has been photographed for the USBC supplement if you want to see better photographs of it. Another test can from Peoria. This was on eBay. Again, photograph for the USBC supplement if you need better photographs. It's a contoured can, and the brewery information says brewed and packed by Paps Brewing Company, Peoria Heights, Illinois. There is a red, white, and blue version of the contoured can from Milwaukee, but why the all black one was Peoria was odd. And then back in the 40s, if you came and stayed at one of the, the, the Jefferson Hotel in Peoria, Paps had these little mini bottles. This was the bottle, this was the label. But they had this mini bottle in every hotel room as you stayed, and it had this little tag on the neck label. It said, welcome to Peoria and the Illinois home of the world famous Paps Breweries. We hope you enjoy your stay to Peoria and we cordially invite you to visit the Paps Brewery while here. Life in the Hotel Jefferson is pleasant. Add to your enjoyment of having a bottle of Paps Blue Ribbon beer served in your room or in our casino, lounge or coffee shop. So is it get people to come visit the brewery when they were visiting. So that was late forties. So in the fifties, you know, this miniature bottle had this little tag tied to the neck. And it said, we hope you enjoyed your visit to the Paps Brewery Peoria. And it was a little fold out. And on the inside, your interest in Paps is sincerely appreciated. You know, what do you have? A neat little, just a neat little souvenir that they gave you after, after your tour. And then when we were talking about, you know, the blue ribbon malt extract cans, I think that's all I have here for show and tell. Hey, Kip, a question came up from uh, Shiner Bach. Uh, I guess you can't get his, it's, he's, he says it's Scott Ostrom from San Antonio. And he basically said that uh, he had lived uh, up up there in the Illinois area, and he wanted to know how close you were to Crevy Corois, or how you ever pronounce that, C-O-E-U-R? Oh, Creve Cor. Yeah, yeah. Creve Cor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep, I I live about 15 miles north of Peoria and Chillicothe, but Creve Cor from, from where we're at now is maybe five miles. Okay, all right. Five miles southwest of here. But earlier in the presentation, when I was talking about the Paps branches, if anybody, you know, if you're interested in brewing history, this book, The Paps Brewing Company, The History of an American Business by Thomas Cochran, this was written in 1949. Paps gave him access to all their records. You know, it's amazing how 
how Paps kept everything. So when he when he went through, he was he was a, a college professor who wrote the book, but he had access to everything. But the detail he has in this book from before prohibition, he describes how the branches work that, you know, most branches lost money, but the master company made money. It, 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 it's, it's really a good read if you're into brewing history or perhaps in general, that, that's, I really recommend that book. We couldn't have done that, that the PAPS chapter newsletter without it. I totally okay. agree. Good. Yeah, totally it's, it's agree. amazing the information in that book. Well, the other thing, Kip, too, is that uh, once those guys come up, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll have a formal announcement from the BCCA out to all the members so they know that it's back up and uh, for them to come by and visit and stuff like that. So Definitely. That's a good opportunity. Definitely. Uh, maybe we can even convince them to put a BCCA tackered up in there. Uh, I don't know what uh, they're willing to share up on the walls or not, but I think that'd be fantastic if we could get a BCCA tacker in there as well. Could the ownership that it's the, the steward for the 33 room now, they also own a barbecue restaurant here, slow hand barbecue, which I highly recommend. And they have a craft beer tap room, poor brothers. They don't have so Poor Brothers, they have 15 different craft beers on the wall from all around Midwest, around the country. You come in, you pour your own. Really neat concept. They don't have any coasters. So luckily, Greg Lanahan will give me sleeves of the BCCA coasters. So if you go to Poor Brothers Tap Room, you'll see BCCA coasters over there. So I'm sure we could get a tacker in the, in the, in the crapper at least. <laughs> Well, so I when you're sitting there, you're staring at it. You got. We, we'll have their undivided attention. <laughs> yeah. I got another question for you. Yeah, Dan. Um, I was. Let me screen share it. It's a can I got from. Oh God, I was in eighth grade. Went to an auction with my dad. I don't know anything about it. Um, this is Paps Half Court. It has a flat top lid, but it's air sealed. So I just don't know if the brewery gave it away or what. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that was a poll. If I don't know, I'd, I'd have to look, but uh, right. I might be wrong. Yeah, it, it has a flat top lid, so I don't know if it just like is a you know, I don't know like a display can or not. Yeah, that that just had a uh, I never had a uh, pouring on it. Just it was just a flat top. I just don't know much about it. No, there was actually Vance. There was actually a couple of flat tops that uh, had that design to it. Uh, one out of Peoria and one out of Milwaukee. So it, it looks like there was uh, oh, and one out of Los Angeles as well. So it very well may have been a, an original flat top. I, I don't know because it's just it, it's air sealed, so I don't know if they just put the wrong lid on top, but they gave it out, you know, after you did a brewery tour or Thank what. You. Does it have a wide seam or is it a glued seam? Um, it's a wide. I think it's a wide seam. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not with my collection right now. I don't have. My parents won't let me keep. Uh, my mom doesn't like me at collecting beer cans. Um, <laughs> but I like to do it anyway because it's fun. She needs to get over that. Yeah, I know. I just, I, I will keep. I told myself I'm not gonna collect, you know, beer glasses from Nebraska, but then I started to uh, collect etched glasses from different breweries because, sorry, my dog's barking. Um, but uh, I started looking for uh, etched glasses because one was from Fremont, Nebraska. I grew up. I, I live in a town between two big breweries. One, they're both pre-prohibition. One lasted through prohibition pretty far. Um, but I never seen anything from the brewery in Fremont, so I bought that etched glass. And sure enough, you buy one thing, you buy more. So I just I just bought a uh, Storrs Brewery etched glass that's pre-prohibition. It's even colored. Just got that in the mail today. As but you I, know, as you know, Vance, it's a very enjoyable hobby. Oh yeah, I'm, I I like it. Just just slip her the BCCA magazine every once in a while. She'll start to go through it, and maybe she'll get an interest herself. I, I, uh, I've been trying to take some stuff to school, trying to get kids interested. It's hard because they just care about phones or with my school, they care about a lot of drugs. So hear that. no, it's not good. Well, I go, I go, I live in a town. I'm, there's only like, Oh God, I'm a high immigration town. 
So we had a meat packing plant here in town. So, but it's kids are just stupid. Phil's been quiet. He hasn't asked a single question all evening. He was eating earlier, but I, I figured he'd maybe have to have at least one question for his buddy up there at Kip. <laughs> well, hang on. I got a question for you. You would know. I was, um, last time I was in Peoria Heights, I um, stopped in and talked to uh, Mr. Petit, and he was telling me that the half cans, you know, the larger ones, were only made in the summertime. Is that true? I've are only filled in the summertime. I, I've heard that too, and I, I don't have any information to doubt it. And I, I it makes sense to me that it makes sense to me too. You need that extra four ounces. It makes sense that the cans would be more valuable, right? Because they only made them half of the year. But I guess you made five million compared to ten million. It really doesn't matter, does it? Right. Right. Uh, hey, Kip. Yeah. Well, Still, excellent, good to see you. Ex excellent presentation. So you. here's my question, and you figure the cone top guy has to work cone tops into the discussion. <laughs> so Paps was one of the early adapters of the beer can. So did you find anything um, while doing your research as to how they come, how they came to choose American over continental in their cans? I, I have not. So I, I don't know if American reached out to Pabst or Pabst Street. I, I don't know. Isn't Why did they never make a cone top? Yeah, just the snap cap, but there was a yeah. room from Peoria, but we've never seen one. So we've kind of maybe in the past year put that rumor to bed that Peoria never made a snap cap. So like, why did the brewery like, I know, okay, so Pabst didn't make any quartz other than our cones other than the quartz snap caps. Right. right, right. So why did so why did the brewery in Columbus? Why did they not have flat tops? Why did they only have uh, cone tops? The mm -hmm. brewery in Columbus, Nebraska. I, that's the brewery I live in. They uh, they oh. did uh, the Ron's cone. It, well, because they were a small brewery, and small breweries tended to have cones because they could ease more easily adapt their bottling line to cone tops. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, it's a boring can, but it's really cool, though, at the same time. Right. I've never, I've never, I think I've seen one once. Yeah, I did, I've only seen one. Years ago, there was an aluminum can, too, that was put out. It was in a, a quart, I think, size, but it was, you know, it stood like a, a foot tall, and it's <laughs> all aluminum. There's only two known that I know, I know about. I never had one, but I now right. that I do aluminum aluminum beer cans, I wish I had it. You know? Where, where's that yeah. one from? I, I'd probably Milwaukee. I don't know. I, I, I don't. It, know. I, I've heard I rumors. Of, I've heard rumors that one of those was from Peoria, Toby. It could be. I, I don't know. See I, the label, and the label said Peoria, and and that that bottle was on eBay, but the seller, the way they wrote the description, was so vague that nobody knew what the hell it was. So whoever bought it got it dirt cheap. <laughs> so kudos to them. I need to watch more eBay. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Kip, um, is there a way to know on the employee badges, the number of employee badges, which ones are from Peoria Heights? I, I'm still trying to figure that out, too. I, I thought those metal badges were only Peoria, but I've heard recently Milwaukee did them. Really? In the same format, the same looking? Those same yeah, way? and I, I, I can't verify that Milwaukee did. Yeah. You know, Peoria, if you if you haven't seen them, there was a metal I got them, yeah. Identification badge that you got as an employee with your employee number on them. Yep. We were always under the understanding those were only for the for Peoria. Interesting. At Newark, those were Steiner different. would know, wouldn't he? Steiner would know. That's pretty simple for him. He should exactly. But it, it would be neat to see an employee list with their oh yeah. These. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. What about those um, anniversary pins? Is there a way to figure out what year or roughly what decade they're from? Because some of them, you can change the ribbons on them. On them. It's probably the layer ones. And then there's some of them that are, you know, solid pieces that you get for each time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm not sure. No, shut up. Okay. So... In the rustlings a couple issues ago, I did a little story on the keg lining 
and how it became and who started it. And obviously Kruger was the first one to, to use it, but it wasn't long after that, that PAPS started fill, using it and filling their cans and they signed a long-term agreement with them. And I got a little bit about it on this article and I don't know if Danny's sharing it or. Yeah, yeah. yeah we can see it. So that might answer a little bit of why Paps and cans, not cones. Yeah, out. they, yeah, they were happy with the keg lining and and show. Right. Uh, see if I can. Hey, what trying you to look up. It's Paps, huh? That the art can. Nice can. So someone just had come in, uh, Chuck, he said in the text that he uh, lives there in Peoria, Illinois. Um, I don't know if Chuck is going to be able to unmute his mic. Let me see if I can. I can ask. Yeah, see if I can. Hello, fix. Chuck. Chuck, you're on mute. Yeah, I don't know if he's got his camera up. He was, he was texting. So I know he obviously wanted to at least introduce himself. Chuck, if you're close to the 33 room, stop on by. <laughs> Knock on the door, let you in, man. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if Chuck can get his his at least his mic up and running. I'll ask him one more time to unmute. So he said he was there in Peoria. So uh, I don't know if he's a collector or if he just happened to come across. Yeah, I think if that's Chuck and Molly Gray, yeah, they're local collectors. Oh, are they? Okay, okay, cool. One other, let me share my screen real quick, see if this works. Okay, so I'm gonna permission. Yeah, here it comes. Okay, so can you guys see this picture? Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So here's cool. here's a here's a better photo of the 33 room. I'm sitting behind the bar. This is how it looked before it was subdivided. When they subdivided it, the the, the window in the middle, that's now a door to the street. But what I want to show you is the bar. If you notice the bar, there is no bar door for the bartender to get behind. Hmm. Let's see if I how well I can so behind the bar, there's there's cabinets. It's hard to see. But the doors that I have open, that's, you know, all the dirty beer glass that the bartender would load up racks he's showing else that we and he would, he would send that to the back where the dishwasher was. That's how the bartenders got to the bar. You had to crawl. Right, the it was either climb over the bar top or climb through this, but perhaps wanted such a clean looking bar that there was no bar. So he had to crawl in from a trap door from behind underneath the back. You still sharing the screen? Your uh, yep. yep. You're still sharing yep. your screen. Can you, you see it? The picture down, and then go back to showing us the doors because you couldn't see them. Oh, okay. I, oh, yep. Sorry about that. Yeah, and if you want to see what Kip is showing, where his uh his image is, if you pin them to the top or pin them, you'll 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 be able to see it better. So if you click on his photo, there's a or his video, there's a little three little dots that says pin, and that's how you can actually pin it. They have so a, door has, a door has hey, since been added nice. into the Thanks. <laughs> a door has been added into the bar since it was originally built. But if you look at the doors I have open behind the bar, that's how you crawled into the bar. You went behind. Was there, an act, was there an actual kitchen or something there at one time? Do they serve food and everything? I have to assume so. Nope. The only thing they had was bowls of pretzels on the table. Every picture I've ever seen is a bowl of pretzels. I don't think they ever did any formal events here in the 33 room. It was just, here's your free beer. Here's your pretzels. The Blue Ribbon Hall was a 500 seat auditorium. They did large formal events there. Where was that at? It was in the brew house. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I've got some really grainy photos. I don't think I have any here. Do you, know one, do you know one thing I haven't seen, Kip, and, and you see it a lot, obviously, with Budweiser and everybody else is when, when they used to go to Budweiser and stuff, they give you, you know, the, the, the hospitality room can that was kind of a rolled top. I don't ever know seeing 
perhaps have any hospitality cans with the roll of tops. Did they do that at the at the 33 room or anything you know of? Yes, I do have three or four different rolled rolled lip drinking cups. Okay, so they used to give them out there at the hospitality room? Okay. And well, the story I was told is in the 50s when you bought a keg at your local liquor store, they would give you a case of the cans with the rolled lid because that was your cup for the keg. Okay. So, okay, I, I, okay, so to answer a question earlier, Edgar Miller was the Chicago artist and sculptor that was hired to do the mural in Blue Ribbon Hall. This is probably the best picture. There he is on a ladder. I mean, I, I'll try to get a good scan of this, but that was the mural that went up in Blue Ribbon Hall. This was from, that's the laboratory. And that, those came out of that, those yeah. PAPS news, right? Exactly. This picture here, sorry for the, the crappy quality. That was from the 33 room or over here. So the reason, why, the reason why I bring up the PAPS news is uh, I, I, I spoke with Randy Karasek a little bit late, but he does the Beer Magazine Viewer. He has, I would say, about 40 editions of the PAPS News. They're, they're, you can view them up in Beer Magazine Viewer, but he has not scanned every one. And obviously, he couldn't get 40 PAPS News editions scanned before this event, or we would have pulled right. a lot more stuff out of there. But as you can see, what Kip is holding up with the beer magazine, uh, or the uh, the pure the the Paps News thing, there's a lot of really good photos in those. Oh, it's and, amazing! And hopefully, yeah. through the holidays, Randy said he would do his best to try to get some of those scanned and made made available up in the beer magazine viewer. So, just wanted to pass that along as well. Well, I remember reading on Facebook that Steiner had every single every single edition except three. I, I believe it, Michael. So I'm this, surprised he didn't I'm have trying more. to show you, this is Blue Ribbon Hall that they had here in the house that seated 500. And it was in the brew house. Which one was the brew house now? I should know that. It was behind the office building. So the old one. The yeah. Building. Or no, this was one of the newer ones. But it's hard to see in the picture, but everybody has the Paps China in front of them. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'll, but yeah, if... If and when these blue ribbon news, this was this was the blue ribbon news that came out for the blue ribbon week here for the heights. Give Randy this issue alone just for Peoria photos is is amazing. Yeah, I, I think it is going to be. I think Randy has every one of them, if I remember right, talking to him, Mike. He 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 said he doesn't know how quickly he could get them all scanned in, but I said for historical purposes, I think it'd be a, a really good thing oh, to have. He didn't think folks would have that much of an interest because it talked about, you know, local events that they did at the brewery and stuff like that. Well, but it's history it's that a, needs to be recorded. It's a lot of hard work. Exactly. And Clayton Emery can tell you about how hard it is to scan old magazines in. And Where's he located at? Who, who Randy? Yeah. Ra Randy's in Michigan. But if you never use something, he has a program called Beer Magazine Viewer, BM, uh, BMV. And you can see all the Mary Boxster editions in there, all the BCCA magazines in there. You can search them, and all those are available. The only ones he didn't do every page of was the Paps News. And I, I've asked him to do that, and he said he will work on that as much as he can. About three awesome. months ago, I sent Steiner a mail. I said, dude, I'll fly into Milwaukee to help you out. <laughs> I got plenty of miles to come in there and spend a couple of days and scan stuff all day long. Yeah, Randy's in Michigan. I don't know exactly where in Michigan, but yeah, he, he really wants to do that. And and Clayton, just in the text, he, he put a link up there for Beer Magazine Viewer. There's, there, awesome. like I said, there's the Mary awesome. Boxsters that are up there. There's the BCCA magazines from, you know, the early 70s all the way up until uh, most recently. We have a deal with him where he doesn't post the last year's worth of BCCA magazines, but when I do historical stuff, I use that beer magazine viewer all the time, and there's a lot of good information in there. So, um, yeah, when he gets the blue ribbon news uploaded, 
and what's great is like one of the issues I have, like when the snap caps came out, they will show all the advertising and the point of sale stuff with the snap yep. cap, with dates. Yep. So, so you can definitely like, oh, in, in March of 56, this came out. So it, it's very- Especially those boxes, especially those Christmas boxes that you can't find anywhere. Joe right. wants to talk, man. Joe, let Joe talk. Joe, what do you got? You got to unmute. You're on mute. Do you know sign language? Um, you might have to unmute him. That's the problem I was having. There we go. I did it again. Asked to unmute. Go on, Joe. Unmute. There you go. Beautiful. All right. Uh, Kip, great, great presentation. And uh, Thanks, I Joe. live in the back. I live in the backyard of the Paps Brewery from uh, uh, Newark. And uh, right. you know, over the years, um, we've had uh, members of our club who have. Uh, marauded through that brewery um and it seems like it seems like uh and i know toby's been a recipient of a lot of the, the uh, uh stuff we found because she's she's you know i know she's been a long time paps collector but uh just brings back memories of us you know going through finding recipes in the in the uh in the offices of andecker beer and things like that you know so uh it's been a great uh, relevation as to you know, what we've experienced here in New Jersey, you know, and uh, I don't know why, but a long time collector, I know I notified him that uh, uh, Denny McAvoy, uh, uh, Toby, I notified him that this was going to go on. I don't know why he didn't get on, but uh, you know, we found service pins, we found recipes, we found uh, all the archives at, at the Paps Brewery in, in Newark. And uh, it's just been, uh, it was, it, it was, it, you know, exhilarating to go through all of that stuff you know again no cans but all that other historic memorabilia you know so right uh, again great job uh one one question when is 33 room going to be going to be open uh did you you have a date on that basically covid has slowed down everything yeah yeah right now originally the the ceiling was white the jeweler came in he painted it a dark blue which really dark in this room that's why i had problems showing you he's got painters coming in right now the, the ceiling's going to be repainted white the brewery in a case the main frame is up he, he needs to get the rest of the shelves in the lighting's been wired it, probably not until the covid is lifted he's going to do any official openings you know i i have a great relationship with robbie and the grindstone group where i can do stuff like this I would be able to, we could do a small events here for, for brewery and collectors, but as far as, it, it's kind of funny, you know, for the fire marshal and the occupancy, the room he's got, he figured the occupancy on a good day is 33 people. So with the COVID crap, I mean, he really can't advertise anything, but, but small events we can do here. So I'm expecting probably next spring at the earliest, you know, something like big official events. And yeah, Joe, I don't know if you heard me announce. I, I said that what we would do is that when Kip gets the word that the 33 room there in Peoria is going to open back up, we'll do a BCCA email blast out to all the members so that if they happen to be passing through the area, they know to kind of take an opportunity right. to, to go. Yeah, to I think, I think I did, I did hear you mention that Keith and, uh, um, you know, my, my thoughts are since, you know, Jersey's running for, uh, uh, convention in 22, uh, if you're going to have tickets, uh, we'd like to purchase a few and raffle them off. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just got to throw my AC in 22 pitch in there, Keith. All right. But that, that's, so. that's okay. We got you. So we're here for man. So Kip, can we revisit something you talked about right at the beginning? And I think it was, um, you were talking about when they came they distributed their beer in the city through saloons or whatever, and you called them something. Um, and was there any of those still um, intact oh. where you can visit? Because I know Brian and Zach do these tours where they go and look for this stuff. And I know Brian and Monaco got in late and he might want to hear about that stuff. Oh, the, for the tide houses? Yes. Yeah, uh, I don't know of any tide houses in Peoria from Pabst. I do know of one for sure, a Gipps Tide House, 
and I've heard rumors of a second one, but we haven't found it yet. If, if let me, I don't know if I have a picture here, but the, the Gibbs Tide House, Toby's familiar with this. They, they have a mosaic tile front doorstep with the Gibbs logo in it. Hopefully I can try to find it. But if, if you didn't hear the, my earlier presentation, the only Paps Tide House I know of is in Kiwani, Illinois. It's called Cerno's, C-E-R-N-O, apostrophe S. You can look it up online. Paps, uh, it was the late 1800s. Paps had the original, it's a 50-foot mahogany mirrored bar that they had built in Belgium and shipped over. There's late hand carved lady figurines on either side. There's two paps light up thing. I mean, it's amazing. So if you, if you can get to Kiwani, go to the, the Cernos. Hopefully here I can I can find a picture of the Gibbs Tide House here in Peoria. That's the Gibbs uh, front door. Uncle Chuck's exactly. We had a yeah, Uncle Chuck's right. We used to have beer cans. See that. Yeah, here we go. It's a mosaic. You know, it's it, it's it's not painted or anything. It's a mosaic stones. Yeah, I've got Isn't it here. Get that up to protect it or anything. What? Isn't there any way to like get it up to protect it? I'm not even sure it exists anymore. I, 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 I... It does. Can you see my screen? This picture was taken in 1987. Yeah, that's the same one. Same All they've same... done. Toby, they put a bunch of that caulk to fill the cracks in. Yeah. It's there, I, this is a picture. Yeah, and, I, and, and mine's got the uh, the cracks in it. Yeah, but it's the same one. And and well, maybe the, other, the other the other mine's actually rectangle. There's something built. Yeah, your crack's different than this one. Yeah, that's oh. mine. Mine's rectangle. <laughs> Hold on. Wonder where what the difference is there. Oh wait a minute. There we go. Well, I think it's the same crack, but 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 you've got that. Yeah. It's not. They've taken away the square there, and they've put a doorway or something in the back here. It's, it looks like somebody stained the upper. There, corner. yeah. Yeah. So what this is, it's it's the corner porch to an old bar. At the time, you know, we talked about yeah. oh, Dome Tap, Heart of Illinois chapter. When we stumbled across this bar, realizing it was a Gibbs Tide House. Mm -hmm. Um, it was Uncle Chuck's Dome Tap. The, the owner, his name was Uncle Chuck. Super guy. We He let us have shows there for free. They had a side yard. Other than the fact that you don't want to be in this neighborhood when it gets dark about a couple of guns it's on your side. It's a picture of Uncle Chuck. <laughs> yeah, and he had this it yeah. was stained glass dome over the bar, but that's Chuck, Chuck Mishner. Yeah, well, there he is. A, friend of, a good friend of his, his name was Pee Wee. So Pee Wee, you know, he was the local drunk. He, well, he'd come out and we'd have our shows. Well, Pee Wee served in the army in World War II. He was stationed in Seattle. He's like, my job was loading cases of lucky OD cans in planes to ship overseas. I handled thousands all of drab beer cans. <laughs> but yeah, Uncle Chuck's, I mean, we, we had a great run of shows down there at Uncle Chuck's. This is the dome in the bar. It's a light, like a like like a crystal thing. It's reflecting yeah, on the picture there. Through the basement of the bar, we didn't okay. find anything in that place. It's a beautiful thing. The bar is now closed. People are living upstairs, but like I said, you don't want to go in that neighborhood without a couple nine millimeters on your side. <laughs> it was it's, that way before too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was bad back then, and now yeah. you. Know, Go down there, but, but no, we don't know of any Paps Tide houses in the area, unfortunately. I think that was just a bar. What about the copper kettle in the heights? That was pretty tied, wasn't it? The penguin, yep. Uh, the penguin changed to TNT's oh, TNT yeah. down right before COVID hit. Copper kettle, it's just right across the street from where I'm at. It's it's some kind of craft shop for years oh, really? now. Yeah, I mean, as you know it, it yeah, not anymore. Yep. Do you have any kind of a date on that uh, that show that we had at the thirty-three room? 
It was March of 1988. Because I've got my, my I'm, I'm in the, I'm in my photo albums here. <laughs> awesome. March of yeah, I was 20 years old. I couldn't afford a camera. It was all I could do to rent this place. I think I, I, think I had some pictures. But we sold every table. I, I mean, it was an amazing show. And That's March. That's 87. See, I'm not sure if Mike Bender was at the show. He was real good about videotaping. I know he came to one of our shows at the Gibbs Brewery. I know Harry Keithline was there. He came. Yeah, up. Harry, you, Brent Burnett from Galesburg was here. Denise Moline. Nobody I've talked to has pictures yet. How about that one? I didn't know you wanted them. I got pictures all over the place. Oh, look at that! Nice awesome. young boy, just in the same place as you are now. Yep. Look at that. <laughs> and that's Jim Searle, isn't it? Uh. Yeah, yeah. Is he still around? Yes, he was supposed to join me here tonight live, but you know he's been having some health issues, and with COVID, I don't blame him for staying home. Oh yeah, he was having health issues twenty years ago. I, I'm yeah. glad to hear he's still alive. Yes, yeah. Oh yeah, Jim. For those of you who don't know, Jim Searle is probably the ultimate brewery and a collector here in Central Illinois. He's he's definitely got good stuff and a, a lot of gifts that I never saw oh God, anywhere yeah. else. Yeah. If it was made in Peoria, he has it. Just right. And whiskey. I mean, this guy could have a museum that that would he run for their money. Who's the guy in Morton? Wasn't there a guy in Morton who was big club? Bob Mutters. Yeah, Bob Mutters. I, I'm pretty sure it was probably Bob. I know his son collected as well. His, Bob's still around. He came to Yeah, he still collects, but he's, I, I haven't seen him in years. I got another picture. It'd here. be nice if your friend could uh, take pictures of all his gift stuff to share with people, like a virtual museum. On, on a side note, jump into the Gips thing. Before they tore the brewery down, I had permission to go through Gips. Came in the one door, like where the offices were. You went down the stairs. In the corner, they had a fireplace. Damn, I wanted that fireplace. I don't know <laughs> if I have any. What was I, that? I, I had a premonition something was in there, but I said, why would anybody put anything in there? They, for some reason, they, they boarded up the fireplace. I, I got the pictures at home. They boarded up the fireplace. For some reason, I decided I need to pull that board off the fireplace. When Gibbs went out of business, they hid a time capsule in the fireplace. The very first full bottle after prohibition, hand dated, was in there. The first bottle dated June 21st, 1911. The first bottle they put a crown on was full, dated in there. In the early 50s, there was a fire in the building that housed all the cardboard boxes, so it, it went up. They had melted bottles from that fire in there. All the pictures that was in the president's office was in there. They were trashed, but it was amazing that they had the, the frame of mind to put a time capsule in there before they left. And, and for a collector to find it was a, a lot of hand dated first, first day bottles in there. So we had some good luck at Gibbs. <laughs> so Mike, I'm gonna pull up here real quick the uh... The beer magazine viewer and the 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 Paps Blue Ribbon News that uh, Randy has, he has 63 issues. So when you go to like 1941, you can click on it. It it says one page, but really there's 63 pages. And here's the display of that page. But there's 63 pages just in the first edition here. He has wow. he he had. Well, I don't know if there's 63 pages, but. Uh, Cause that might, well, there's. Yeah, I think he just scanned the cover of each yeah, one. He, he just scanned the cover of each one, but all these that he has, uh, he's going to try to do his best to get them scanned at, at, at some. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, he's got all these, he says 63 issues that he's going to try to do, but yeah, he's got them all the way through 1955. Wow. Um, there's going to yeah. be a lot of, a lot of good information in, in some of these. So we'll see. It what is. Happens. It, Paps did one hell of a job with their blue ribbon news. Yes, they did. Yeah. Okay. 
Since Michael, talking, I love your your porcelain signs. <laughs> since we're talking about gifts, do you guys recognize this? Oh wow! What's what's that? Who is it? From the brewery. Those who are in the brewery should recognize it. Oh, you got the you got the glass with the the. I got a picture of that still on the wall, or I mean, in the brewery. From the office area, see there. Yep, yep, I've got pictures of that still hanging in there. It Did took a bit, it took a bit to get it out. Look at that. See the. Uh, there you go. You know where? Well, let's see if we can get it in here. Can we see it? Uh, see not it. quite, Mike. There we go. What's that? This, for those of us who know the heights. Uh, directly diagonally from the office, there is the uh, spotted cow was in there. I think people, we remember that. Well, before the spotted cow, there was an antique shop. And that antique shop, the guy who owned it was uh, on my paper route. And so one day he called me over and he showed me six cans, the export cans that was found in the crawl space of that building um, where the spotted cow was. But he ended up giving it to me 15 years later. But the point wow. is that PAP sign was it that was the window of the brewery that was there or the, the bar that was there. I got oh, wow. down in the in the basement and we were rooting around in there, and that's where the tables were. There was a restaurant there. That's probably from the 50s. And there were all kinds of tables and chairs and you know, candles and stuff like that. And there the uh, window was down there. So I got that out and I had it cut down. Wow. Later, later. But yeah, those windows, the, the, the Gibbs windows, we, they were, one was a door and the other one was the office one or the office side. And we had to take the trim off to get them out. We knew it was right. going to be torn down. So if we didn't, if they broke, they broke, they were going to be going anyway. But the, um, we took the trim off and had to pull out the little nails and everything like that. And we got it home. That thing sat in my bedroom for almost 20 years intact until one day my mom moved it and cracked it and it oh, broke in half. Crazy. So I wow. said, you're paying for the frame and that's why we got it all framed up. And still, you know, it's all framed up and it's safe now. That's cool. But, uh, it had to come out one way or another. <laughs> right. And what, when I got permission you know, from one of the, the Jacobs to go through there. Those are great guys. They are amazing. So I got permission to go through there and I knew that was there. So I ran up to the office building. It was gone. Like <laughs> and the next day, they were tearing it down too. Did you did you see the safe door that was there? Yeah, yeah. Where that was you kept going in the office. Well, the original safe for the brewery. It was probably a seven foot by three foot door. Wait, that I didn't see. I only saw the one that was in the open area that was covered in cement. Okay, okay. So yeah, so. Where the bigger one was, you took if you were looking at it, if you went to the left, there was a small room back there. That's where the original safe was from pre prohibition. It had a hand painted river scene on it that said oh, that. Company Peoria, Illinois. When okay, so after Gibbs went out of business in '54, Canna Pop Soda Company came in and, and canned soda cans there for two years until 56. So when they got done, Foster Jacob Electric bought the old Gibbs Brewery and used it for their electric company up until it was torn down in the 90s. So I got sidetracked here. <laughs> Gibbs. Yeah. So, okay, hold on. And then I found Yeah, so okay, so they so when they when they shut down the state need there was an old drawbridge that went by the Gibbs Brewery. I need to post pictures because they had a really stupid, like a 30 degree angle right in the middle of the drawbridge. It it was the stupidest design for so the state finally had to get rid of it. So they bought the old brewery building. So when Foster Jacob moved, they took the door down to the safe. They have that in storage somewhere. So, so that day when they were moving out, they let me go around. I was able to get a couple doors out and some miscellaneous things, but they still have a few really cool things. We found, we, my buddy business. and I found a tampon machine in the women's bathroom. 
Yep, and it still had the tampons in it because I <laughs> yes, sanitary yeah. napkins from the fifties. Yes, exactly. I we got the machine because I popped a nickel in it to see what would happen. We got the <laughs> machine and then we stupidly tried to break it open to get out the buffalo nickels. Oh wow! Stupidly. Yeah, I, I got one of the sanitary napkins. I wish I'd taken the machine. I didn't even think about it at that time, but unbelievable. But yeah, I'll have to. I mean, we could do. Keith, we could do a follow-up webinar on, on the other Peoria breweries. I think that'd be good. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's what we're, we're trying to do, is we're trying to have folks that have an interest in, in trying to put some stuff together. Like I said, I, I think the best format with the two that we've done so far now is to kind of have kind of a, 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 a structured way of doing it with a PowerPoint presentation so that you, you kind of run on a timeline. Uh, but then, right. like I said, with this and just open it up and talk about other things as well. But yeah, if that's right. something you're thinking about, let me know, because I'd like to continue try to do these. I, I've gotten good positive feedback on, you know, us, us trying to do these. Which one did you do the first one? Uh, we did a Bach uh, webinar. It's up on YouTube. If you look on the, for the, the Brewery Collectibles Club of America YouTube channel, there's a, a, a one up there on, on Bach. And that was from... Um, Jim Romine uh, did the Bach one. I know Bach um, very well. Yeah, I'm going to try to do <laughs> a hams one if I can get some folks to volunteer their, their time in December. I can't make any promises on that one yet. I don't have any commitment. But uh, this that's what we'd like to be able to do is talk about stuff like this in general. Um, and you learn a lot of things. I think people learn stuff, historical stuff that uh, is, is going to be lost if we don't continue like this. So. I mean, we could definitely, definitely do one on Gips. We've got presentations on Lizy and Gips that we've done. Upstairs in the chair. And, and I think Toby's probably the only one of the group here tonight that knows this, but my first daughter, I named, you know, you're familiar with Gips Amberlynn beer. I remember the story. <laughs> yeah. My daughter's name, I named her Amberlynn after Gips mm -hmm. beer. And has anything changed yet with Gibbs? Because we were talking before about, I remember you saying they couldn't find a recipe or something like that. And <laughs> yeah, so, anything so new after about Prohibition, Gibbs reopened with a new ownership group from Prepro. So they thought they could throw out a new recipe for Gibbs beer. Apparently, it did not go over here in Peoria. So all of a sudden, amazingly, hey, we found the original recipe in the vaults here. Oh my God, the original Amberlynn is back. <laughs> Are they doing it? So it's kind of funny. They thought they would do it on their own. They screwed up and they had to pull the old recipe out of the vault. To... That's Lysy. Yep, your good picture of Lysy. And I got another one. I'm watching to try to get the flash off of it. That's Lysy. You don't want to go down that area either. <clears throat> She didn't no. want to do it when I took the pictures, yeah. <laughs> That's why it's in the daylight. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it, it's really neat that the majority of, of Lysi is still there. Well, this was taken back in uh, 87, 88. Yeah, I need to get that picture of me, you, and Jim. That picture, is, that's classic. Oh, yeah, I agree. So I, so I pulled up Beer Magazine Viewer real quick, and I just happened to do a search for Peoria. And one of the articles that came up from 1984 uh, talks about the Gibbs Brewery. And if you notice, uh, Ms. Toby Harms, uh, number 586, was yep. the author of that uh, that historical uh, article yep. the Gibbs Brewery. Right, right. So, it, yeah. was the, it was on the uh, cover, too. Exactly. The, the cover yeah. had a beautiful picture of the cone right. top. Okay, so if you went, if you walked in, if you could go back one slide, Keith. Yeah, there's the cover, yeah. A couple. Oops, hang on. Where you showed the... There we go. One more. I had somebody yeah. from Peoria that wanted the yeah. Omaha Gibson information, and okay, I, gave, so, I gave it to him. So this, yeah, Jim Carbolito. That's it, that's it. So this photo here, that was the office door. If you walked in that door you walked up a set of stairs you went into the room that had that fireplace where the time capsule was but on the door is foster jacob electric they were the ones that took it over after they shut down up until well, i was actually eyeing that gips cement to try to figure out how to get that out of there that <laughs> they took it out they, 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 they did. that building's been ripped out 
Yeah, they did. They did have a crew. Those five blocks that spell out Gips. They did have somebody chisel those out. They did break one of the squares getting them out, but they got them out. Where are they at? Foster <laughs> Jacob. It's probably sitting right next to the safe door. Those led. <laughs> what you can't see in this picture, if you go up about twenty feet, there's an arch thing that said Gips Brewing Company. Yeah. Eighteen eighty-five. Yeah. So Gips was started in 1881, but the brewery, yeah, there you go. So that picture yeah, there, the brewery was yeah, built in 1885. Gips started in 1881, but the brewery we all know and love was 1885. They did take that metal plate off that said Gips Brewing Company. Oh, and there was a metal plate. I'll be down. So they did salvage those. Yeah. All sitting in storage at Foster and Jacob. It, it, oh. So yeah, so this was from a BCCA magazine. Like I said, with Beer Magazine Viewer, you have an opportunity to pull up these old magazines. And then down at the bottom of there, it says, Toby Harms, Peoria's first lady of beer cans. Has she been was, yep. That was my logo, yeah. Yep, has been <laughs> collecting was. cans since 1972. Right. Yep. Toby, I'm so glad you joined us tonight. I mean, this is awesome. Oh, I, I wouldn't have missed it with Kip there. I haven't seen Kip in ages. <laughs> yeah, since the last convention, I mean, we only see. Well, we, yeah, we passed past um, doors a little bit, yeah, but you know, right. I mean, essentially, I, I haven't seen you in twenty and years. Your daughters were young and seeing your original collection, and <laughs> right, right. No, I think this. I think you did a wonderful job. I'm, I'm impressed. That's great. Thanks. I mean, I'm single during COVID with nothing to do, so of course I'm going to dive into this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I am too, and I'm doing nothing either. <laughs> I, I can't wait till we can go out and go to a show again. Exactly. Well, we'll have a show up here in Peoria Heights, so you'll have to come up. Yeah, well, it's, it's, when you let me know when, but make sure I find out, because I'll be there, like yeah. Like you said, we'll, we will, there'll be an e-blast. If you're yeah, both yeah. single, maybe you can get together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old enough to be his grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> you're just experienced. <laughs> whatever <laughs> so yeah so that would be a good one to do then would be Gips uh, and what's the other brewery you'd want to do there Leslie Lysey Lysey yeah, L-E-I-S-Y -E -E yeah yeah Lysey and then Union Brewing Company was before Pro before Prohibition and then they they merged as Peoria Brewing Company after we could add them in as well okay so if needed we could we could come up with a pure uh, the other breweries of Peoria. Yeah. Well, I've been trying to get Steve Anderson and, and Joe Prin. They did one for Idaho for the one of the local uh, museums or something like that. But I wanted them to talk a little bit more about Indi uh, the Idaho breweries up there. And both of those guys are pretty smart on the Idaho breweries. I don't know if it'll be an, exi an exciting topic, but, you know, anything you can learn historical wise, I think is important. So. But right. I would like uh, someone to do one about uh, Nebraska. I don't know if you can contact any Cornhusker chapter member. Because um, I just, I'd like to learn more about, you know, because I collect this stuff from Nebraska. Well, like I said, man, so I wrote two histories, I think, of, of Nebraska, at least a little bit. But yeah, maybe that's something I can work with them on as well. Because I know, I know Dr. Cahoy on Grand Island wrote an article a long time ago for the BCCA. Um, I wrote an article for the BCCA actually, too. Um, so I know he wrote one. I read through all that. That's how I found out my family owned the brewery in Nebraska City um, by just reading that. Yeah, so what was it? Was it was it Columbus, um, Nebraska? Is it was that the the, the city for which one? For, for what brewery? Yeah, for the for the the brewery near you. You said. Um, there are actually, there are a lot of breweries near me. Um, I'm kind of eastern Nebraska, eastern central Nebraska area. So Columbus is 16 miles away from me. Fremont Brewing Company is 30 miles away from me. Um, Omaha is like an hour and a half away from me. Um, West Point Brewing Company is like, I think, 45 minutes away. Um, Grand Island, Hastings are two and a half hours away. Um Oh God, there's there's some more breweries that I'm thinking of that I'm blanking. Crete's like south of Lincoln, um, which is near me. 
Um, like, for some reason, all the breweries are really close to me. Um, but the brewery that I've been trying to find stuff from, oh, I can't think of what it is. Yeah, there, that's a Wilbur's near me, too. Yeah, that's the article. And that's that should be most of that stuff, I'm pretty sure, is Dr. Coy's. Yeah, so I'll, I'll let me go back. Uh, Glenn, Smith, is, Glenn Smith wrote this article, The Beer Cans in Nebraska. That's from a 19, that's from a 1980 article, but with Beer Magazine Viewer, you can pull it up, and it basically goes through all the stuff. There's a, obviously there was at one time there was a stores mock up uh, gallon can that's featured in there. That's that's not the tap, is it? That's a different one other than the tap. There's so there is two. Well, you see I the was... one that the store is at and the tap sitting on there. There's a, a a gallon makeup can. Yeah, yeah, but does that's that's not the that's not the one I know of. That's a different one. Yeah, this was from a 1980s article, so I, I'm not quite sure what may or may not have happened. To yeah, that. that that store's that store's gallon's different than the one that I've seen. I haven't seen it in person, but I know there's there must be two stores taps then, or two stores gallons. I was told that by uh, someone. That they made two different ones, but I've only heard of one, and it's the store's tap. That's a different one. So I've never seen that one before. That's a, another Nebraska can I've never heard about then. Yep. Because I didn't even know Mets Malt Liquor existed until a couple of years ago. So then Phil Cahoy wrote an article. That, this one's fairly new. This is from, uh, let me share it here real quick. This is from 2018. So it's a fairly newer version of the BCCA magazine from 2018 but that was written by Phil Cahoy and let's see I don't have I got I got that GI special label I got the personal liberty label I, I found a bunch of rare bottles yeah um one one time but that Columbus sign's really cool that, so yeah, I don't know how many of those are. Maybe I can I can work with some of those folks to kind of do a history one for Nebraska as well. I I'd like for people to volunteer, but um, so far nobody has volunteered their services. It, it seems fairly easy for f some folks to say, "Hey, you could do this," but then not so many folks to step forward and say, "Hey, I'm willing to do this." I mean, yeah. I like to sh I like to show up just to learn. I mean. I don't collect paps. I have some of that stuff for some reason because yep. I pick it up. But I just like to learn about stuff. So, uh, I, I mean, the first two were kind of handed to us between Jim Romine wanting to do Bach and Kip wanting to do the Peoria Brewery. We were very lucky. Uh, I've got to work a little extra hard now to try to get some folks to say, "Hey, I'd really like to do this" or something like that, rather than, "Hey, it'd be cool if you could do this." Well. There's a lot of cool things we could do, uh, but it takes people to do the work to do the cool things. So. Well, I think I think it was a success, and I think if the word gets out that it's you know a success, people will be more interested in putting the time in to doing I, I, something. I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. So we'll have to see. Maybe uh, Bill can do something about Pennsylvania, Canadian. They need beer. Bill's working hard as a uh, he's he's keeping the peace on the BCCA Facebook page. He is uh, working extra hard as a uh, moderator on there. Uh, I go back every once in a while look at the log books. And, uh, Bill is definitely uh, keeping the BCCA Facebook page safe. Um, we have had a lot of folks that have tried to get in. Uh, or have uh, decided that they wanted to talk politics up there. Uh, and Bill has made sure that uh, he has kept the peace. So Bill works hard every day. I can, I can guarantee you that. So, All right, Kip, anything else you kind of want to pass on or chat about otherwise? Again, if anybody's got BCCA questions, I can't promise either Bill or Joe uh, where 2022 is going to be at, but... Uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to speak any other uh, BCCA related information or questions that somebody may have. Uh, we had our board meeting uh, on the 7th of November. We broadcasted Facebook Live, so it's available up there. Uh, I haven't given Danny the, the video yet, uh, or I'm going to have to work with Danny if we want to post it up on the, on the BCCA webpage as well. 
um, so that folks can see how we make sausage. It's not a pretty business, I can guarantee you that, um, but, uh, but it still will at least inform the members on what we try to do for the membership. So yeah, so if anybody's got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer anything that you may have related to the BCCA. Kip, were you just pointing at me or were you? Uh... Nope, that was somebody else. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Clayton, yeah. So, yep. so. You have a lot of, do you have any contact with Steiner up there in, in Milwaukee? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to learn a lot more from him. He has so much to share, so much knowledge. I, I, I was really hoping he would join us tonight. For those of you that are unaware, John Steiner was the historian for PAPS in Milwaukee. From what he shares, his collection is amazing. You know, a lot it's of far more than what we've seen. Yeah, I mean, Keith, like I like I told you that the the image of the casino bottle is from his collection. It's still full. It was the first bottle filled here in Peoria in November of four. The stuff he has from Paps is just incredible. I mean, the stained glass window he has in his house. I mean. He's probably got more stuff boxed up from Paps that we've never seen. Yeah. I mean, the, the guy is a huge, tremendous resource that really wants to see it accurately portrayed. In, in... We need a virtual tour. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and Michael, he's offered me to come up and see his stuff. I really need to get up there. Dude, soon. you set me up. I'll, I'll pay for the plane ticket up there. I have plenty of miles. Okay, I'll, there, we'll I'll, I'll get with him and see if we can arrange a date. But, but the Peoria stuff he has, among with everything Paps, is, is just phenomenal. Yeah, let me know about that, dude. Sure. The, uh, he, I, I just think it's important that, that it gets documented. I mean, he would unfortunately die next week. Nobody would know what to do with this stuff. They would just think it's junk. And, and, and that's like me. My daughter might take a couple of gift things because of her name, but for the most part, nobody knows what the hell I have. Just give her my number. <laughs> I, I will. And I'll give I, you my number. <laughs> a guy that I knew that I, I raced bicycles growing up and, and a buddy I met, his dad worked here at the brewery. Mm -hmm. And he passed away about three years ago. You know, Dave calls me up and he's like, hey, He's like, we're having an estate sale this weekend. You know, basically this is the retirement money for my mom. You know, if you could spread the word, you'd know, be great. My dad had fish and stuff. There's some Pap stuff. I'm like, oh, that's right. He worked for Paps in the Heights. So he told me, he's like, hey, there's a light that dad had that he got from the 33 room that's in the basement. You might be interested in it. <laughs> I'm like, perfect. So I got there early that day. I was the second one there at this estate sale. I'm like, all right, well, luckily they don't know about this light. So it opens up, I get in there, I run down in the basement. I'm looking all over for this Paps light from the 33 room and I don't see a damn thing. And I'm looking and there's two or three rooms and I look and I go upstairs, I come back downstairs, I look again. I don't see nothing. So I said, I sent Dave a message on Messenger. I'm like, hey, I, I, I'm not seeing this light. He's like, go down the stairs of the basement, take a left. There's two lights in the ceiling. One hangs down, one doesn't. The one that hangs down used to be at the 33 room. I'm like, oh, run back downstairs. And I see this light hanging down and you can definitely tell it didn't belong in this house built in the 70s. When they renovated the 33 room at one point, Buck Jones took the original light. It, it was actually back in the behind the back bar of the room back here. It hung back there because there was no hanging lights out here in the room. But if if that house would have sold, nobody would have known what the hell that light was. That was but the first thing they did was pulled it down because it didn't match and it got thrown away. The original globe was on it. So, so Danny and Keith, last month for the box seminar, the room I was in, I wired that light up. That's the light in my main PAPS room, which, which luckily if Dave wouldn't have called and told me that thing, it would have been gone. And, and luckily that same estate sale, 
Dave told me that his dad pulled this plastic can right off of Augie Papp's desk. So, so his dad's Papp's collection, I, I bought this along with the employee beer and about a hundred beer cans. It would have been pitched if I wouldn't have happened to have been there that day, just because nobody knows the history of, of that stuff. <clears throat> So yeah, hopefully we'll get it back here, get it where it belongs, and you know somebody can take care of it for people to enjoy for the next hundred years. Find anything out about that uh, kettle yet? Out in Dunlap? I found out more, and I'm and I'm glad you said that, Michael. So in the pictures of the presentation when they were building, when when the pictures of the tanks being put in the stockhouse. So the what I did find out, Michael, is they weren't the brew kettle tanks. Uh -huh. But when they started dismantling the brewery for salvage. The tanks that they had in the stockhouse, a lot of local farmers bought them. They took the caps off of them, flipped them up, and they put their feed in them for their cattle. So there are farmers around here that have some of the tank caps from the stockhouse. Yeah, how many of those? A hundred of them or something like that? Exactly. There was a lot of them. I'm still trying to track down who the farmers are to see oh, if that doesn't matter, dude. Only those copper ones matter. Those exactly. Hot copper ones. Exactly. So we got to figure out where those copper ones ended up. Yeah, they got melted down, probably. Probably. And 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 like I said, when the brewery closed down, the, the employees they pretty much had their way taking the china, and that's what I feel happened to the silverware, is it was true silver. Yeah. So when these guys took it home, it either got thrown in their silverware drawer and used for years, or it got melted down. Probably still some in the heights being used as silverware. There's got to be. I've never, none of them come up for sale. I know two people that have them. One has one fork and the other has a pickle fork. What is, is it the, um, does it, the Paps script like those first cans? The Paps logo that that was here on the back bar is what stamped. It, it, I didn't know if I had the cursive, you know, the Paps cursive. Yeah, it was the Paps blue ribbon logo from the 40s stamped in them. I've, 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 I've held one fork, but I've never been able to, to have one for my collection or to put on display here yet. Mm -hmm. Toby, did you ever see any of the silverware? Yeah, I had a couple pieces of them. Um, okay. Before I sold them, yeah. I had a knife, fork, and spoon, and I think I had like a little uh, olive fork, you know what I mean? Okay. I know Jim that. Searle has one of the little olive forks, but that's about all he has. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole set. But I, they like I said, they, I sold them all, you know. I, you who'd ever, you sell to? Ever go to uh, like the all, all kinds of people Armies around yeah. town? What go, for Kip, like go to the Salvation Armies? I do that when I go to you know places like that, I'll dig through the silverware, drawer. yeah, yeah. Because I'm oh, yeah. sure most of it ended up they went home, they threw it in their drawer, and it just got used. It was, just, when I, yeah, when I saw mine, and they knew that they were getting something because they had to pay for it. <laughs> Good. Well, those are still around. Yeah, they're, they're around. I, I, no, my stuff went to everybody. Um, I had to sell everything because I was moving. Well, first I moved from the big house to a duplex, and, and then I moved from there to Arizona. Where'd you and, live in um, Arizona? I lived out there for part-time and then full-time for 20 years now. What um, part? Um, Phoenix, uh, Sun okay. City. Other than Green Valley. My parents retired out there. That's down by Tucson. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend down there. Yeah. But uh, no, I lived out in Tucson there. I'm, I mean, in Sun City there for 22 years there. Mm -hmm. And I've just moved back here last March mm -hmm. to Tennessee. Quite a difference. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I miss it. I'd, I'd go out in a minute. I, I have a plane ticket ready to go to the December show, but I just know I'm in the next email is going to be canceled. I just know it. I can feel it. You know, and they have it. It's December sixth, I think. That the it's an outdoor show, so I, I think they should have it. But who am I to talk? I got to go through the airports. Hey, Mike. To get back, you were walking away earlier when I said this. Toby caught it, but there is a new chapter out. You're in North Carolina. There's a new, well, a new old chapter, Smoky Mountain chapter in Tennessee. Um, Knoxville area, I think, has um, re. Well, 
I appreciate that, but my only interest is Peoria Heights, brother. Right. Well, if you just want to be around people who have common interests, beer can wise, I guess, but I don't have any more cans. All oh, okay. I do is Peoria Heights right now. All right. All my income goes to Peoria Heights. Right. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. How, how did you see that we were advertising this? And the reason why I ask is that we put it out in eblast. We posted it up on Facebook. We're trying to make I sure. We on get... Facebook. I got it I on got, Facebook. I, oh, I saw yeah. the eblast. I don't do Facebook, but I, yeah. I, I do. I do eblast. Yeah. I saw it on your Peoria page on Facebook. Exactly, and I meant to bring that up earlier. Any Paps fans out there of Peoria, there's a Facebook page for Paps Peoria, and I shared the the flyer, and that's how cool. my so. Yeah, I just want to make sure we we do our best to get the word out so that people hear about stuff and then they don't say well no, i didn't know about this or i didn't know about that i i set it up as an event on the bcca page so it would you know people could click on it and then it would remind them that, that it was coming up so um like i said we want to try to do our best to, to kind of keep information flowing That's and don't be even printed it off so yeah um, well, well, there's a mistake in it too you know me and for detail it says that it's it starts at seven uh eastern daylight time yeah and, and there eastern is no eastern, eastern daylight time anymore it's eastern standard time it's, <laughs> whatever yeah, so, details yeah. <laughs> I, I would like I, to make a suggestion though the uh, for the future because i knew this was coming but then i forgot about it tonight so that's why i was 10 minutes late <laughs> it might be good to send out an email or uh, put another ad up you know maybe an hour before or something like that so people i meant to send out a reminder michael right. hours before the meeting started right forgot and Keith, a couple hours, i knew about this a couple hours but i forgot about it yeah but, keith, but keith, i got an email about it i would known about it again yeah. keith can you unmute brian he has a question okay yeah let me uh let me see where is brian at okay. but yeah for those of you there's a facebook page called paps peoria please go there and send a request lots of good photos and information about the peoria brewery here so, so Brian, you should be okay now. You can speak. Yeah, uh, hey, I just wanted to mention you're talking about doing another one of these things. You know, I, um, you know, I'm quite the fall staff guy, and uh, oh, I, I'd like to, I could put together a nice presentation about some fall staff stuff, and we could do oh, that. Well, I'm going to oh. write your name down, Brian, and make sure that. Uh, I oh, I'll, yeah, I think that would be great. I I have lots and lots and lots of stuff online, or I mean, on pictures and stuff already, so okay. I could put something something together really. Yep. You're, you're, you're on my short list, Brian. <laughs> Excellent. Nice background, Brian. Oh, thank you. You know, <laughs> Toby, uh, just a couple of things I didn't want to mention. Um, I still have some stuff that I got from your house in Belleville a long time ago when, when you were selling off your collection. Uh, I got a couple of things and then I still have, uh, that I had a big four foot by four foot outdoor sign that you gave me, uh, the plastic insert. And that is now my friend Dan Corey's house in his garage. And you worked with his mother in oh, Peoria yeah, Heights. Yeah, yeah. She was, a, she was uh, one of my workers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll be darned. Small yeah. world. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's what, who's asking where my stuff went? There's where some of it went. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm building it back up again now. I'm after any piece of paps I can find. Uh oh. I, I just got a, my first tin over cardboard the other day. I'm I'm working on it. Uh oh. I have one oh, neon. Too. I gave away. I well, gave away. I sold. I had 13 paps neons, and I have one left. <laughs> Do you still have your paps toilet seat? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. There, boy. That's gone. I don't even remember that one. The day the truth. It was in your um, downstairs bathroom at the Belleville house. Yeah, I I, I do have my Pabst uh, toaster. <laughs> you know, it, when you when you toast the bread, it comes up with the word Pabst uh, burned into the bread. It's really pretty pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I've, I've been trying to get my hands on anything I can get, you know, but I I'm I'll starting over basically, you know. I'll sell you a chair, Toby. I have a chair coming. I told you. <laughs> Not like mine. Well, it was, I think it's one of those two that were on eBay because that's where it came from. Well, it, it came from me. Yeah, Mar Marcia bought two of them and, and then she's selling me one of them, I think is what the deal is, something like that. Ooh, maybe they got some else, Kip. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm wondering which one she's talking about. Well, well, she's got my old one. I know she has that. 
but I don't think that's from, well, I don't know where it's from. It, it's a, it's a, it's a weird one. It's got, it doesn't have a much of a, it's, it's a, it's a hard chair that, you know, regular blue, uh, wood chair, oh, okay, but the back cool. of it isn't filled in the way chairs usually are, you know, it's, it's kind of, that's the one I had that she bought that for me. You know, I, I, I got to drop this stuff somewhere. <laughs> Like you talk about your kids, my kids are going to have, they already know that they better not give this stuff away, but you know. If they do, give them my number. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No, I, they know, I, you know, they, they, they've they been, having, my daughter's coming over tomorrow to make me some more shelves for the cabotles. But the, it's like when we first started collecting cans, I've, I filled out one wall and I'm already around the corner and now I've got to fill out the other wall. They just keep growing. So what, are you, what are you specializing in now? Can aluminum, aluminum cans from Anheuser-Busch. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I've got about seven or 800 of them now. Mm. And, you know, there's a big, big group of them. But it just keeps growing and it's outgrowing. It, it, it gets a whole room. I got two bedroom house, but then I have a office-like area where I, that's all my PAP stuff in there. Oh. Yeah. Did you guys see the There's picture? The dishes, yeah. What? So I shared a picture. This is from the 33 room. This is one of the original. Yeah, yeah. Chairs that were here. So I don't know if that's the one you're talking about, Toby. Yeah, yeah. They're they're all exactly the same. I've never seen any variation in them. Yeah. Hey, Kip, did you get any of that dinnerware up in Chillicothe at that antique shop by the train station? I did at Callahan's. I, I was yeah. quite a bit of what he had. But yeah. He didn't have a turkey one, huh? So he knew he, it was a former employee that had grabbed a bunch of it on his way out. Yep. And, and that's where Mike got it from. Yep. He offered me the deal of 200 bucks for all the rest of them. I said, no. I said, yeah, they weren't real cheap on their prices. I, I probably paid full retail for what I got, but. Stuff doesn't come by too often. You got to do what you got to do. Exactly. I'm still trying to find you the the creamer and the, the, the sugar bowls. Appreciate. It. I think I have a creamer. I just need a sugar bowl. Yeah, I do have a I do have a creamer. Because Jim Searle, the guy me and Toby were talking about in Pekin, he's got two or three full sets. Wow. I might have to buy a full set to get you the the sugar bowl. Well, I mean, let's just buy two of them from him. Which, which I might, and which luckily he's he's known enough people over the years to, to gather enough to, to create some sets and he's finally getting up and in his attic and getting some of his extra stuff out. He's 83 now, so. Does he have a turkey bowl, to, turkey plate though? He says he does, I haven't seen one yet. Maybe he has six of them or so. The only turkey plate I ever saw was that plastic one. Yeah, yeah see, it's like and that's platter. the thing. I, yeah. I've never seen one, so I I've never know. seen a, pl a turkey China platter. China or, or what, but I've heard rumors there was a turkey platter. No, I've never yeah. seen that one. Doesn't mean it isn't out there. Right, right. And yeah, we'll see if anybody buys them at 200 a pop. Just a little bit too much. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is. They were the simple plates too, not anything special. That's two hundred just for a plate. Yeah. Forty bucks. Yeah, I think I paid a hundred for mine. Plates. For the plates, yeah, but I probably sold them for the same thing. I don't. Think, yeah. A lot of my stuff, they they couldn't wait to get it. I'm sure it was underpriced. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, in the yeah, I, saucer out there now for two hundred. Is there? I think I'm going to work on the easy stuff first. <laughs> you have to buy another house. Oh, they've I got just, everything. I just, I just had this house built. So this is my, uh, this was my plan. Yeah. This is where I'm going to stay forever. This is, you know, this is the one I'm going to stay at. But I move every 10 years as, a, as if you look at my life all the way through. So in that case, I, I got nine, nine and a half to go. We'll see. We'll see if I you have five more rooms. I'll, I'll leave one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Why? Why? Um, Anheuser Busch stuff. Why is that? Well, I when I had to give up Peps, I wanted to replace it with something. And you know, you can't go to a show and not collect something. You know, 
And I and they were just coming out in 2004. That is the first one that, that ever came out in the Cabottles in this current run, you know. And what is, um, what is the bottles? What is that? Cabottle is what we call it. The aluminum bottles. Oh, the aluminum ones. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just I just started because they, they were cool. I mean, yeah, what can I tell you? I have this habit that I get one and I have to have a set, you know. And all, yeah. all my life I've been that way, you know. And so now I have eight hundred of them, you know. <laughs> oh, and there's neat ones too. I mean, there's ones from all over the world, you know. Oh yeah, um, I don't do I don't do those though, but they're they are some really neat ones, yeah. Yeah. Like you, know, you were saying when you got you buy one, you want to get the rest of the set. <laughs> I got I got one etched glass, and then I finally was talking with the uh, oh, BCCA guy out in Lincoln, who was saying there's a lot more etched glasses from uh, Nebraska. Yeah. Well, I uh-huh. think I have three of them now. I'll, I'll show you guys what they look like. There's a lot more than three out there. I'll tell you that. I know. Well, this one's from Fremont. Oh, those are cool. This one's from Willow Springs. Have you got like paper in them? Yeah, paper, just so you can see it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this one I just got today. Yeah, I can't. I can't hardly make out the etching at all. It it's dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, Omaha Brewing Association uh, gold medal beer. Cool. Yeah, like I say, there's a lot more than three out there. Oh yeah. I, I I never did glassware because I had I had a friend in California that that yeah. said that he then and I followed him all the way along the way. He said uh, don't collect anything breakable because he lived in that in the um, earthquake area mm-hmm. and um, so I all my life I gave up bottles because of that you know regular bottles and I gave up glassware and you know and mm-hmm. stayed with aluminum bottles. Well, that's safe, you know. I wonder. <laughs> Yeah, and then this is this is I think one of the few things I got from Willow Springs. This was actually a, a, a distillery, also. They made bitters and stuff from there. Oh. But this is a tip tray from the brewery part. They changed the soda tray. during Prohibition. They stuck with soda until the '90s. They closed in the '90s. Nice. Nineteen nineteen nineties, and so I don't know. And this is a ball tap knob. No idea what that's actually worth though. There's a lot of those out there too, Vance. Yeah. I, yeah. I got a lot of, uh, I got, if you're, Vance, if you're interested in Nebraska pictures and stuff, I have lots and lots of uh, 1950s and some 1930s pictures of the Falstaff Brewery in uh, Omaha I'd share with you. Oh, yeah. I like, I love to look at stuff. Um, yeah. Was there any signs that are from the Falstaff Brewery that say Omaha, Nebraska on them or no? Oh, lots of them. Yeah. Mm hmm. There's stuff actually, that's Omaha at, specific. Yeah. I went to, uh, actually, I was at Garage Sale here in town. I asked, do you have any old beer cans? And they said, no, we got old beer stuff. But they, <laughs> they were like, they had old uh, cases. So I found an old uh, Falstaff case, wooden one, and two cardboard ones that are still full of bottles. Oh, cool. But I got a bunch of, uh, but I did buy, you know, I don't know if they're called glass cans or not. They're really, the really short, uh, stubby ones. Um, they're all still full of beer. Then one day you'll get drunk enough and you'll drink that beer. No, I've been trying to get my dad. How to many drink of us have? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> hey, um, Toby, have, have you ever seen um, a Pabst export can, the, the early ones with the IRTP withdrawn? I'd say. I'd, I, I, at one point, I had almost all of the exports. I didn't have all the detailed ones, though, so I'm not sure of it, whether I have it or not. I, those I've also, I sold too. You know, I, I don't do 12 ounce cans at all anymore. That's what I specialize in. I think that's the only one I'm missing. And I've seen somewhere online that somebody got one off eBay. Of course, the seller had no idea what it was. But you look on the bottom, and it has withdrawn, you know, what you know, withdrawn tax free, blah blah blah, on the panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a couple of them that were withdrawn free. That's why I don't know the details. Yeah. Okay. From the early ones, the silver ones, or what? Yeah, the silver ones. Yeah. Yeah, the silver ones. The only withdrawn free Peoria did. Yeah, but there were were several varieties of that silver one. Yeah. Okay. And I don't, I don't know whether they all had withdrawn free on them or not. I don't know. Yeah. So let me let me pull up this. This is a, a Chris Taylor article. 
uh, for the BCCA. Let me pull it up here real quick. Yeah, I, mem I mem remember this article. So he, he wrote an article and he's got he's Ooh. got six different images of the withdrawn, it looks like. I can't tell if they're all withdrawn or not. The one in the middle obviously is the with or the, the variation 12 right. down there. Yep. Yeah. Um, is pure that long open or the first pass scan or no? Yeah. yeah, yeah about four, I have four different ones of those. Yeah, that's the only one that I saw there. And then he, he had a, on a previous page. Let me go to the previous page. He had this one as well. Uh, that was a withdrawn free can. Yeah, those were just Milwaukee. No. Yeah. I, I know, obviously, like Kip said, the OD had come in withdrawn free as well. So. Yeah, and those ones after that, too, the gold ones. Some yeah. Of those. Yeah. Yeah, the only withdrawal can free that I know about a Peoria is the silver one. Now, wasn't that made when the war ended, if I'm not mistaken? Exactly. Yeah, that was during the war. Okay. Yeah, the, the can that came out after this, it's starting in 46 through 50. There was a withdrawn free from Milwaukee, but I've never seen a Peoria one. Yeah, I used to have a Milwaukee one. Stupidly got rid of it. Hmm. How, how tough is an uh, OD can? I've never seen one. Pretty damn tough. Yeah, they don't pop <laughs> yeah. up often. Yeah, they're tough. Did yeah. they ever make a crown tainer? No. No, it's just 12 ounce. Uh, there, was, there was a display that was done by Chuck Hillier of just OD cans back uh, 20 years ago, maybe. Uh, the gorgeous, gorgeous display he had. Just about all of that was known. Hmm. I can I can dig up that picture if you want. Yeah, <laughs> if I just just tell me which which convention it is, and I got a picture of it. it I'm trying you know, to find Jeff Lebo did a, a page originally up on on all the OD cans that he knew of. I'm trying to find my bookmark for it right now, and I'm not finding it. Um, well, how many breweries were told they had to brew beer for the war? Well, it depends on who you talk to, if yeah. they were told to brew or if they volunteered their services to do think, it. So. Usually it was a volunteer, I think. It wasn't told to, yeah. Did anybody ever but write I, I would guess on 50. It's in that neighborhood. Hmm. Right. Did they write a story yet in BCCA about that? That would be an excellent story. I think a few different ones have been done, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Right. That's where we got to look at those old magazines and stuff. Yeah, that, that that display of Chuck Hillier is in the magazine, probably, if I can remember what year it was. So, uh, so Vance, if you go to a, a Can Smart, it's uh, Jeff Lebo. You haven't probably met Jeff uh, before. Let me uh, let me pull up his withdrawn free page here real quick. So, here's his withdrawn free page. There's some Wrong information thing. in there about the OD cans, but. But here's the start. Here's all the flat cans. These are either OD or withdrawn free. Then there's the cone tops. And there's the crown tainers. So, so those are all, he, he probably has at least an image of just about every one of them. So that if you go to Can Smart, Jeff Lebo's page, that's, that's what he's got. That that old Dutch can is pretty cool. How many of those are around? Uh, yeah, old Dutch is uh, are pretty tough. Um, like they said, almost all of those are are pretty tough in there. So, is Jeff selling now? He's got an auction site up. So I, I heard that, and I, I I haven't seen it. Yeah, he's got uh, another auction coming up. Let me see the date on his auction coming up. November 29th. The good guys have one tomorrow. Uh, Jeff has got one on the 29th, and then the good or Dan Morian has got his uh, December 12th. So they're all they're all doing that. Yeah, so. I, get, I get emails from Dan Morian. I, I looked at a couple of his stuff. It's beautiful stuff. Beautiful I, don't know who's, stuff. I don't know who's paying yeah. the price on those, but so be it. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah, what, what, what was up with that one or two genuine draft going for like 200 something? I got two of those that I found in a box. 
Vince, we 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 can't even explain it to be honest with you. I thought that was like twenty five bucks. Yeah, well, that's and even that's probably fairly high, but none of us can explain it to be honest. With right. you. So. There is a market; they will pay. Exactly. All you need is two bidders. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Who don't know each other with big pockets. Yep. Two bidders mm -hmm. who don't know each other. Yep. Not necessarily. So yep. It's uh, it, it's good to see it that the market is competitive right now and that uh, people have an interest. But it's also difficult for those that have been kind of hanging around going, I think the price is going to go down because there are going to be more collections coming out only to find out that, yeah, they ain't showing up at a cheap price. So yeah, it's, it's difficult for me to learn to see what stuff goes for when more of the market fluctuates so much. Well, Vance, like, 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 you know, you go to blue gray, you got some of these younger folks coming in and then when they walk into a room and they see that a beer can is $200, that kind of turns them off a little bit sometimes. So, yeah, like I'm just like, now I'm just focusing on Nebraska cans, trying to get those before I look for anything else. And I've seen, I'm going to say mostly all the Nebraska cans either in person, in person or not in person, but yeah. it's just that just, that's yeah. probably your best bet is to focus on a certain area and then kind of see where you can grow from there then. Well, any, anybody else have anything they want to bring up or talk otherwise, but. Thank you, Kip. Yeah. Thank you, Kip. Kip, Kip thank, thank you. you. Yeah, so, thank you. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, yeah, which, uh, like I said, I want, to, I want to be able to have us be able to do more of these if it interests anybody or gains us some new folks that uh, have an interest that didn't have it before, I'm more than happy to have it happen. So, yeah. All right. Any last minute uh, bids for discussion?